Houston. And for that, we get you out to Fenway Park and the guys calling today's game, Joe Buck, Harold Reynolds, and Tom Verducci. That's us, baseball's best on display here at Fenway. Here comes Mike Trout. Happy Memorial Day weekend before a big barbecuing day. Tomorrow we get ready on a perfect day at Fenway Park for this matchup between the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim and the Boston Red Sox. What a matchup. What a night. The weather is ideal. And now welcome inside the broadcast booth, everybody. I'm Joe Buck. Tom Verducci over there. Harold Reynolds is over here. They've been playing baseball in this park since 1912. And now here in 2015, tonight's matchup is one of two teams that so far have been frustrated and frustrating, especially with the bats. And Harold, we'll talk about Mike Trout. He is baseball's best. Talk to David Freeze. He said, talk about Mike Trout for three hours. You guys will be fine. Ratings will go up. He is baseball's best, and he's really the lone beacon in either lineup that's doing his thing. Well, David Freeze is on to something. And if you watch Mike Trout for three hours, you're going to be oohing and on at the fact he does something every night. And let's take last night, for example. He hit a ball into center field. He says, you know what? I bobbled it a little bit. Don't run on me. Sorry. Guns a guy out. Now, how about this for one night? One inning, two hits. But I love the fact every time he runs, great effort. He's got the power, the speed, everything else. And snatching the bag, and he even knows how to put the swim move on you and go matrix and slide around. I can see little young Joe Buck doing that in the backyard yeah. right there on the slip and slide. It is amazing when you get around this guy and you see him, Harold, or Tom in a second, the size that he yeah. has and what he's able to do physically. Another big guy is Hanley Ramirez, and he was outstanding in his first year here in Boston in April. He bangs into the wall. They're looking for him to find it again here for the Red Sox. Yeah, well, in honor of Stephen King, you know, the Red Sox, his favorite club. There are a couple of weird mysteries with this team. Number one, how do they hit 197 against left-handers? And what has happened to Hanley Ramirez? You're talking about a guy who's one of the most productive hitters in baseball in April. And in May, zeros across the board. Now, the Red Sox get another left-hander tonight in C.J. Wilson. The Red Sox insist Hanley Ramirez is healthy those numbers aren't healthy, though. They need him to turn it around. Well, some of the American League's best players on display here tonight, whether it's Trout or Pujols or David Ortiz, Dustin Pedroia, Hanley Ramirez, it's the Angels and the Red Sox, and it's all yours next on Baseball Night in America.
hoping that they will be playing in October. A team that won it two years ago, finished last last year, and right now struggling four and a half games out. Here's the lineup for the Angels. Ibar is now the leadoff man, then Trout. Albert Pujols at first, Cole Calhoun, David Fries at third, Matt Joyce in left. Carlos Perez, the rookie catcher. They like him. Mark Kraus, the DH. And Johnny Giovatella is the second baseman batting ninth. And here is not that Stephen Wright, but this Stephen Wright, the knuckleballer. And will it be dancing here tonight? We'll find out shortly. Once in a while, you may see a fastball, but it's pretty much all knuckleballs all the time. How about the Angels? What a week. Two knuckleballers in all of baseball, and the Angels see them both within four days. R.A. Dickey, of course, the other one. All right, Dickey threw a complete game against him in a win in Toronto. And here's a strike into Eric Ibar as Ibar is getting another chance to hit leadoff in this Angels lineup, which he did back in 2010. Well, that's trying to shake things up, and I, I like it. I like the option of him being at the top of the order. He fits good there or even in the two spot. But obviously, Mr. Trout's hitting two. Mr. Trout now. It's Trout on deck, and then Albert Pujols hitting third. Here comes a 1-1. Hard hit, and a base hit through the right side. Good start for the Angels, who won here last night 12-5. A sharp base hit off the bat of Eric Ibar. You know, it's funny. From our vantage point up here, I was looking at the infielders in the middle of the infield, and they're playing so shallow on Ibar, like double play depth. But I'm thinking, it's hard to bunt on a knuckleball guy. So don't worry about the bunt. And then he drove it by Petey there on the right side of the infield. Well, here's Trout. Ibar will be the runner at first, and you would think, just logically speaking, that you should be able to run against a knuckleball pitcher. Yeah, most knuckleballers have great pickoff moves. There's a fastball for a strike. 85, that's not bad. That's the last thing Mike Trout was expecting to see. <laughs> Doesn't swing off on first pitches anyway. Got a rookie catcher behind the plate in Blake Swihart. He's impressed the Red Sox with how he has called games. Trout gets under it and flies it into right. Easy for Victorino, one on, one out. Defense for Boston. Shane Victorino is in right. You know that. In center field, it's Rusne Castillo. And over and left, it's Hanley Ramirez, who will try and convince the Red Sox that his shoulder is healthy, even though the numbers offensively would not point toward that. Holt Bogarts, Pedroia, Napoli on the infield. Swihart does the catching, and here comes Albert Pujols. I thought it was interesting watching Castillo work in right field yesterday. Never played there. So how do you get out of right, Tom? You drop a couple balls and they move you back to center. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he had one error and then another misplay out in right. Here's a strike to Pools. But they called up Castillo, who had gotten hot, spent some time on the DL. One thing he's had to prove already is that he's going to be able to stay on the field and stay healthy, but was hitting well at AAA, and this offense for the Red Sox needed a jolt. Here's the 0-1. One ball, one strike. On deck is Cole Calhoun. Pujols, you would think, would have the right kind of a... He can hit anybody, but... He keeps his hands back. He's not lunging at anything. He should handle a knuckleball pitcher. Yeah, he's got a nice approach for the knuckler. You know, I was talking to Albert before the game, and I said, you know, he got hit in the hand the other night in Toronto, and then he played the first game back here and hit a home run, his eighth one of the year. And I said, you're not missing a game in Fenway with that little short wall. And he said it was funny. I've had, that was the first one I've hit over the monster. To your point, he'll shoot that ball the other way. There goes Ibar and a shot into right center field. Castillo back on the run. He will not get there. And a break for the Red Sox as it bounces out of play. And instead of Ibar scoring easily, he's got to go back to third base on a ground rule double into right center by Pujols. Bad break for the Angels. You're absolutely right, because Ibar had a great read on this ball. Actually, it crossed second base by the time that ball hit the track. Initially got the read. Maybe Castillo runs it down. But that was a real good read by Ibar. I definitely would have scored. It was interesting watching Castillo. Because the guy was stealing on the play, he broke initially to back up the throw at, at, from the catcher. And then he had to take off and go. So Ibar sees him 
breaking in as the ball's being hit. He just took off. So now second and third one out for Cole Calhoun. And Calhoun, who has moved around in this lineup, is now the cleanup man trying to give some protection to Pujols. Here you go. Watch, watch Castillo. He's going to break in and then go back. Do you see that? So Ibar was like, he's not going to catch this ball. And that's why you can, that was interesting. Don't worry about the throw at home. Worry about defending your territory first, the throw from the catcher. Here's one into left. That ball's going to carry and bang off the wall. Two runs are going to score. Calhoun has delivered a two-run double, two-nothing Angels in the first. Hot ball club right now. Tom, they're swinging it. Well, the rule of a knuckleball, if it's high, let it fly, meaning the bat. If it's low, let it go. And that is a high knuckleball. You see the knuckleball up, your eyes light up, jump on it. It's exactly what Cole Calhoun did. Stephen Wright's got to get that down. So more stress in that Red Sox dugout. As Boston has started this season 19 and 23, they're only four and a half games out behind Tampa Bay. That's... The great news for Boston. The not so great news for Boston is how and why is this going to turn around? Who's going to be the one to step out in front in this lineup? Who's going to be the one to step out in front and be an ace in this rotation? Pretty good in the bullpen, but they have a lot of guys that need to figure it out here fast. Yeah, I, I think they got to get to a point where they have a set lineup and let them just go get it done. David Freeze in the hole, nothing and two. And the bad news for Boston here in the first inning, they're 7 and 19 when the opponent scores first. And that's directly due to the fact that this is a team we thought would be a good rally team, great offensive team. And it's been the exact opposite, below average offensive team to say the least. Freeze just got a piece. Give you our Lincoln Motor Company keys to the game. Well, Joe, in honor of Memorial Day, start your engines. I think there's a big race coming up this weekend. For the Angels, that means the base running. I think they're one of the best base running teams in the league. They showed it last night. And backyard grilling. The Red Sox really need to take care of their own backyard, but they're 2-8 and eight at home this month. And 8-12 and 12 overall. That's just not what you expect out of the Boston Red Sox. There's a new pitching coach. Who took over for Juan Nieves? That's Carl, Willi Carl Willis. John Farrell got to know while both were in the Indians organization. Here's another one to freeze and a good play by Napoli. Feeds right for the second out of the inning. Over to third goes Calhoun. Well, that's a big play by Napoli right there. Ranging to his left, making this play. That ball's down the line. That's a double. And this little carousel continues. So Napoli feeds right for the out. Calhoun at third, two down, and the batter will be Matt Joyce. Well, for all the hand wringing and consternation for the Red Sox with their lineup, it's not really too different in the other dugout. I know they broke out last night, the Angels, but Angels are looking for more offense as well. Joyce hits a rocket into right. Victorino back to grab it. And a loud out ends the top of the first. And the Angels plate two. To work C.J. Wilson with a 2-0 lead.
very different. Dustin Pedroia leads off as Mookie Betts gets the night off. He's at second base. Then Shane Victorino bats second against the left-hander. Hanley Ramirez hits third. David Ortiz cleans up. Xander Bogarts back-to-back -back games in the number five spot. The Napoli, Castillo, Brock Holt, Blake Swihart. And you can see with those numbers on the left that this is a Red Sox team that has not hit well at all under 200 as a group 197 against left-handed pitching and last time I checked CJ Wilson is a left-hander sure is and a good one I think they may have decent success with CJ is a lot different than most left-handers in the fact that he pitches inside a lot of left-handers are going to float balls away and you don't see guys wanting to go the other way and I think that's why they struggle as a collect collectively as a team See if Pedroia can get it started for Boston. He takes a strike, and Tom Verducci, down year last year for C.J. Wilson, seems like a different guy here early in 2015. Very different. Mike Sosha used the word for C.J. that I think is not only appropriate, but a word you never would have used before to describe him, and that's deliberate. He used to be known as a classic nibbler, getting behind, slowing down, overthinking, actually, on the mound. Now... Throwing more first pitch strikes than ever before in his career, working faster intentionally, trying to dictate pace. And a nasty pitch down and in. A strikeout starts the night. And he just went right after Dustin Pedroia, one out. Yeah. Really did. The fastball for a strike, then he came back with the ball he fouled off, and then this nasty slider. That is biting down and in, and Dustin's looking to go the other way. It's a great pitch. I've done a handful of games watching C.J. Wilson in person. Just his windup and the way he is starting his delivery has got more power behind it. Like he is just letting it go. And you won't see him walk around on the mound as much as he used to. He'll stick around that rubber. Six different pitches. Loves to change the speeds, add and subtract off of all of them. No, you're, you're right, Joe. He's really looks like he's really driving and and you know, the first thing I noticed when he was in Texas was how big his legs were and it was almost alarming and now it looks like he's slimmed down a little bit and he's just driving the ball and he's throwing a lot harder, but I, I love the pace Tom. That's the big thing for me too. picking it up. Mm, where's that? Up and away for a three ball one strike count. That's hammered down the line but hooking foul. Ken Rosenthal is with us. Down on the field and you have more on C.J. Wilson. I see why your notes said what they said. I mean he looks he looks vastly improved Kenny. Pitches per inning. That's what he's averaging now, 15 per, as opposed to his career average of 17. And what's interesting about CJ is. How about this try? Infield base hit for Shane Victorino, and CJ Wilson showed what kind of an athlete he is. What a athletic play. Watch him come, and he barehands this ball. He's going to slide, grab it with the bare hand, and release it all in one motion. That was pretty. I know he didn't get him, but man, that was special. Kenny, go ahead. We uh, we were cut off by that effort by C.J. Wilson. Joe, what I was saying was what's interesting about C.J. is that he is a late bloomer. Didn't begin pitching until he was 21. Didn't become a starter until he was 29. And he talked to me in spring training about finding a second gear in his career. And it certainly helps when you're pitching more efficiently. Semi award winning reporter Ken Rosenthal from down on the field. Yes, it is. Congrats, Ken. One on one out very very deserving here is Stanley Ramirez who takes one outside. He works hard man. It's fun being around Ken and Tom and all these different guys all the work they do watching them work. Yeah makes you and I feel we just hang out it makes Watch us again. feel lazy as we should feel nobody more plugged in than our man Kenny. Here's a one oh that's upstairs from Wilson. Two balls and no strikes. I have noticed that since the Emmy, Kenny's notes that he gives us are a little thinner, so he's starting to mail it in a little bit. Man, step it up, Ken. 
<laughs> Ailey Ramirez will look for something to smoke here on 2 and 0. One on one out and he tried and came up empty. You know his uh, helmet's going to fall off on this and his helmet's even got a Twitter handle now. Really? Yeah. Like stay on the head handle or something. Like, I don't know something like that. Stay on your helmet on your head here. It gets a lot of air time because it's always in it's the air. Always falling on the ground. Off. Looks like it. One on one out and a check on the runner. I mean this is one of those. Despite what Hanley Ramirez may say and the Red Sox will tell you he's hit into some tough luck and hung some line drives out there that have been at defenders but for a guy who had 10 home runs in April bangs into the wall hits his surgically repaired left shoulder and then doesn't have an RBI since. I mean the numbers would tell you there is something there for Hanley Ramirez who I'm sure is tired of hearing the label a guy who just misses games and doesn't seem willing to play hurt. He's played hurt here in 2015. Question is, is he hurt or how badly is he hurt? The Red Sox insist he's healthy. John Farrell saying, just watch this guy BP. He's putting balls practically on the mass pike out there beyond the monster. Double play ball. Flip. The throw. And C.J. Wilson faces the minimum in the first. Into the second we go at Fenway Park. Angels on top to zip. The Lincoln Luxury Uncovered event right now. Get exceptional limited time offers. Well, the weather is ideal here on the 23rd of May. And for the Angels trying to take the first two games of this three game set, here's Carlos Perez, a young catcher that they love. Chris Ionetta, who started the year as the everyday catcher. Has turned it on offensively of late, but this Angels team is seven and two with Carlos Perez as a starter here in the big leagues. And there's one thing that Mike Sosha prides himself on: it's young catchers and helping them get acclimated in the big leagues. And he really likes what he has here with Perez. That pitch was up. That's Bogarts. It's short, and that's out number one. Yeah, I mean, we always talk about the players looking for something to continue on jumpstarting their their careers. And Mike Sosa's had some catchers come along. That's got to keep him engaged, too. You know, being able to teach and talk and continue. He's been doing this a long time as a manager. 
He has been doing it a long time as a manager. 16th year with mm. the Angels. Started in 2001 at all in 2002, a six time division winner. A couple of rocky years mixed in there here lately. Last year was not until they got into the postseason and got knocked out in the blink by the Kansas City Royals. Strike one to Mark Krause. Ball one. This big dude at the plate can swing it, man. Not the little guy there. <laughs> well, he can swing it too. Yeah, he's just can. not going to go as far as this guy when he gets a hold of it. <laughs> Two and one. And it's really fascinating watching a knuckleball pitcher work. It's really like the pitch itself is like no other pitcher, but even the delivery, like nothing else a hitter will see. Got under it and into center. Castillo barely has to move. Two out. You know, your conventional pitcher, so to speak, as that arm comes around, it will go to the side of the body. What the knuckleball pitcher wants to do is keep a flat wrist and keep the hand going towards the plate, not across the body. You want to keep that firm wrist locked. Even when you throw a fastball, Tim Wakefield worked with Stephen Wright about that. Keep the wrist lock even when you mix in that occasional fastball. We'll get back down to Ken Rosenthal at some point about the history of Stephen Wright and how he got to this point. And there's another first pitch fastball. Look, you pop a fastball 84 85. For a knuckleballer usually coming in at mid 60s that that's a major upgrade. Look at that. That's 70 mile an hour knuckleball. I mean, that's a free strike. That's like when a fastball pitcher flips in that first pitch curveball. The hitter's going to take it first pitch. For Stephen Wright, the surprise pitch, first pitch fastball. We see now two hitters locked up on it. The 1 1 pitch is oh. hit right back up the middle. Got oh, a piece of right. Play. That's Pedroia. What a play. Wright seems to be okay, and Pedroia. Well, it's just a typical Saturday on Fox for Dustin Pedroia. This ball took a Super Bowl jump. We'll look at it when we come back. That okay, Joe? That's fine with me. Two nothing Angels after an inning and a half. By Team Mobile, switch to the Data Strong Network. Great shot of Fenway Park and a guy they have loved since the minute he got here, David Ortiz. And look at the numbers in yellow, not good. Facing a left-hander, hitting 125. 
with no home runs, just three RBIs off left-handed pitching all year. And one of the big reasons why he's been so good here is that he has handled left-handed pitching. But right now, just lost against it. 91 from C.J. Wilson, a ball and a strike. And that right there is one of the signs of what David's been doing. This ball's going to be inside. He's trying to pull it. And earlier, he used to shoot that ball off that monster. And I talked to him about it earlier today. He said, I'm kind of in between right now. But he worked a lot on trying to get that ball shooting it back the other way and get those guys off his hands. Here's a 1-1, one -one, and that's going to drive him off the plate. Tom, you think he's done? That's what everybody says. He's 39, at least when the numbers start to dwindle, and then the questions come, and they say, is this finally the Didn't time? Didn't we go through that about three or four years ago with Twice, this guy? And how back many to times back years. did Derek Jeter go through that? You know, listen, I think we should learn by now with the great players, and he certainly is a great player, they'll tell you when they're done. Don't count out this guy. 2009 his first home run of the year came on the 20th of May. He strikes out to start the second inning. And C.J. Wilson just came right after him. Second strikeout for C.J. Wilson. Let's go back to that Pedroia play. Well here's what's so impressive. Watch the ball kick back. And his reaction time and everything to get over there and get that ball and be able to make the throw. Watch it kick. And that's why it looks like he overruns it. But the ball had this backward spin on it. Tom, I'd like to see the spin rate on that ball hitting the dirt and kicking the other direction. That's a heck of a play. I'm still admiring that reaction time. 0.13 seconds the first step after the ball was hit. Talk about a quick first step. That replay brought to you by MLB's StatCast Technology. There's Bogarts after the strikeout by Ortiz, a ball and a strike. Yeah, the thing I like about StatCast, it does take you inside a little bit deeper in understanding guys' first step, speed, stuff like that. I, that's the part I like about it. Mm. Strike two. I just think the numbers are fascinating, and they remind you just how great of an athlete these guys are. Yeah. And the reaction time. Yeah. I it's mean, so quick. That's just God given. And then that guy, his uniform is always dirty. A strikeout on a pitch down and in, and Wilson is dealing tonight. Two out. Well, that's a nasty cut fastball there. But as I said from the top with this guy, so many different speeds. In fact, so many different speeds. You ready to play a game, Joe? Yeah. We're going to play speed bingo. No wagering allowed. The reason we're doing this, he had a game a couple of starts ago. He hit every mile per hour between 76 and 93. So we are going to keep track today of how many different velocities C.J. Wilson can hit. Perhaps he'll fill out that bingo card. I like it. We have not. We have nothing marked out yet. He's been working for an inning and two thirds. Well, we well, got people working on that, Joe. Okay. We're, we're just we just starting. wanted to show you that oh. the, it was not altered from the beginning. We started with a legally verified bingo card. Here's Napoli, strike what? one. You know, outside of him hitting all the different various, various speeds, his motion is faster. And so his off-speed pitch is going to be more deceptive. Watch how quick his, his wind-up is. Can you see it? I know you see it, Joe. I, he is, he's like a different guy to me. Yeah. And maybe I'm overreacting to it because it's the first time I've seen him this year, but he is wrapped up and driving toward home plate and letting everything he's got. It seemed like more of a picker before. And, and because his motion, and he's coming after hitters, because his motion is so fast, as a hitter, you're reacting to him because you're starting your hands when he starts and things like that, and then a whoop. Takes a little bit off it. Looking at Mike Butcher, the pitching coach there. Well, for CJ, this really began in the offseason. He sat down with his sports psychologist, and that's exactly what the psychologist recommended to him. You dictate. Don't be reactionary to what the hitter's doing. Don't overthink the situation. CJ is a natural contrarian. He said, go after him. And just to show how dedicated he is, that took time away from spending the afternoon with his Brazilian supermodel wife, Lissala Montenegro. <laughs> That's dedication <laughs> right there, And his CJ. photography pursuits and his race car pursuits. Yeah, Twitter. Renaissance man. Shame he's got a baseball career, huh? Yeah, well, it's, it's paid well. <laughs> oh, Shampoo man. deal. 
Yeah, he is one of the great thinkers in the game. You can ask him about spin rate, guys, and he know he'll quote you spin rates on what he throws and what he tries to do with the baseball. And he does a lot of things with the baseball in terms of cutting it and running it. <laughs> Two out, nobody on. Napoli trying to drive a ball against Wilson. Checked his swing, and the count is full. This is a guy, C.J. Wilson, two-time All-Star. The regular season numbers are pretty good. It's the postseason numbers that he's got to do something about. One and six in his career in the postseason. And a guy who was both the starter and closer as a young guy with the Rangers. Signed a five-year deal in December of 2011 with the Angels. That's hammered. Is it fair? It is gone. Home run, Napoli. Back-to-back -back games, and it's a two-to-one affair here in the second at Fenway Park. And he almost hit the target. That ball was torched. Oh, mercy. But he kept pounding him inside with the slider, with the fastball. Eventually, as a hitter, you're going to look in. And we were just talking about, Joe, how he speeds up everybody. So now he's pu pus busting you in and he's speeding you up. So you're going to look for that ball in, and Napoli timed it perfectly. Boy, they need a lot of that out of Mike Napoli here at Fenway Park. He, I mean, he came within eight inches of hitting that target up. Wow, is he going to get a free dinner like Bull Durham? Mm. That's not. <laughs> Happy birthday. Wally. Well, Wally, I think, is celebrating a birthday here as well. The uh, mascot here at Fenway Park as the count goes to 2-0 and on Castillo. Looks to me like that guy has turned a corner. Mike Napoli. You know, they were coming back from the West Coast trip in Seattle, and Dustin Pedroia and Napoli were looking at video on their phones. Noticed a real serious flaw in his delivery. On his setup, he wasn't getting his hands back at all in the loaded position. And he's a guy who has a great load with those hands well behind him. This week, third home run this week after making the adjustment, getting back to the way he normally loads. Tremendous power. Ted Williams used to do that. Look at swings on his phone. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? How far has technology come? This one hit the inside corner and then was blasted out. By Napoli and this one off the end of the bat to make it a full count on Castillo. You know, it's interesting. We're talking about Napoli's adjustment. I'm looking at CJ Wilson's adjustment. Pounding in, pounding in, pounding in, and then now he goes away. So when you're able to change different lanes, you're gonna have good success. You saw him step off the mound again, take a break, get yourself back in the game, and lock back in. But he's been pitching in and out, and now he's gonna go back inside. And get the strikeout. He struck out the side in the second. But in the inning, it was a home run by Napoli that was drilled to left. Two to one after two. Back after this from your local Fox station.
to you by Chevrolet, the official vehicle of Major League Baseball. Glad they're with us here at Fox. And as we move into the third inning, top of the order for the Angels, and that means Eric Ibar, who singled through the right side his first time. Two to one. Strike one. And you can see where the infield is deeper this time than they were the first half inning. Remember with the knuckleballer, you're probably not going to be able to bunt. Pedroia is backed up now instead of up in when it got ball slapped by him last time. This game inches. I've heard that. Yes. One ball, one strike with Trout on deck. That's hit in the air to right. Well hit back at the wall. Staggering was Victorino. I don't know if he thought he was closer to the wall or what, but that was like tiptoe through the tulips out there. Yeah, he was. He was definitely tiptoeing. I think he thought he was further back, no doubt, like you're saying, but he can play that right field. That was weird. That's definitely the difficulty, the ball directly over your head. He never really got turned until the end. He had some jelly legs <laughs> going there, no doubt. <laughs> My He's goodness. He's on a treadmill. We'll get you some toast there, too, Shane. He's probably, if he <laughs> hears this, he'll think, all right. Oh, he'll be all you over You go me. out there and catch he'll it. He'll be all over it's me. it's so easy. Here's Trout. <laughs> Mike fly it into right his first time. By the way, Victorino's been bothered by a strained left calf. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> one ball, one strike. One out, nobody on. Two to one game. And Trout was trying to launch. You know, I always looked at playing against a knuckleball or like wiffle ball in the backyard. Look at that ball. Look at no movement and the dip on that. But every pitch is going to be different. It's like playing wiffle ball in the backyard. Strike out for round number two in the first of the night for Stephen Wright. Now that one moved like a slider. Watch this ball break away at the last second. All right. Look at that slide on it. The one, the other one dipped down low in on him. That one ran away like a slider. That's the fun of being able to have a knuckleball like Wright does and execute it and the difficulty of hitting it. Did you ever play a knuckleball in the backyard? Play wiffle ball, right, Joe? I play wiffle ball. I, I always was fat. I used to try to catch knuckleballs, and just amazing that somebody can do that to a baseball. And you talk to hitters, you played in this league. They'll tell you a good knuckleballer can put you in a slump for a week. Big time. You know who had the best knuckleball playing catch? Was Cal Ripken. Unbelievable. And he would try, he knew he had a good one that moved that you might not catch. He'd try to hit you so it hit you in your leg or something. I thought you were going to say Wade Boggs. All the position players get too much time on their hands. They all think they have great knuckleballs. Well, that's not how this guy started. He was a hard-throwing right-hander who one year at a minor league stop went 10-0, and but his career just stalled. Pujols could not get the arms extended. Look at this carry back on the track. Castillo makes the catch, and that's eight straight retired by Stephen Wright. On a beautiful night in Boston, this great American city, two to one Angels after two and a half.
Brock Holt leads it off and takes a ball underway in the bottom of the third inning. Holt, Swihart, then back to the top of the order. Pedroia against C.J. Wilson. Who's up two to one. There's a strike. Had a chance to visit with Mike Sosha, the manager for all these 16 years with the Angels during the break, and we'll give that to you hopefully after the first batter. That's down and away, two and one. Tell you what, Brock Holt burst on the scene last year. And he has not stopped playing. They've had to put him in the lineup somewhere. It's a nice job. Yeah, even with with all the money that's been laid out and basically a two hundred million dollar <laughs> payroll, they try to find a spot in this lineup every night for Brock Holden. He can play, as you say, anywhere. And he hits left handers too. Nice job by CJ right there. Got to a three ball count. Went off the back of the mound for a little meeting with himself. Full count. Yeah, I love the fact that you get a guy like Brock Holt who nobody knows, gets an opportunity, and takes advantage of it. I mean, they, when we, when we caught up to him last year, was in Detroit, right? And he was playing in the outfield, had never played the outfield. And then they put him all over the diamond. He was in center, he was in left, he played right, he played second, he played third. I mean, he's all over the place. Ooh. Those guys are so invaluable Tom when you talk about the stress on a pitching staff where you're seeing teams now carrying more pitchers for their bullpen you have a shorter bench if you have a guy like Holt who you can plug in anywhere I mean that's like having two guys and I keep saying they ought to start the count at three and two because he always winds up there and he walks to start the inning. Here is Mike Sosha. First question about C.J. Wilson and how he has looked so good here early. Well, from the end of last year, Joe, he's uh, he's healthy. I think uh, he, you know he, he's the pitcher that he's, the pitcher you see tonight is a pitcher we saw probably pre All Star break last year. Uh, you know, he's got great stuff and he's getting after tonight. Yeah, and it, it seems like the mood around your team, just being around the batting cage during batting practice, is up. It, it seems like you guys have kind of turned the corner a little bit here lately. Well, there's you know a long way to go in the season, but the first quarter of the season, uh, we, we we've been lacking a little bit of offense. We've been pitching really well and playing defense. Defense. So far, if we start to score some runs like we did last night, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll see us make up ground. You getting some head shakes with hitters coming back to the dugout against this knuckleballer? <laughs> You've seen enough in a week. Yeah, a couple of them. But, uh, you know, we squared a couple up, just missed a couple of that last inning. So hopefully we're getting some pretty good looks at them. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for the All time. Right. All right. Here's Blake Swihart, one on, nobody out. That is on the inside corner on a borderline pitch in the count 0-2. I hope Blake's saying, did we get that pitch? If not, you're in trouble. Sometimes as a catcher, this is your chance to say, I want that pitch from my pitcher now, too. Here's the 0-2. Blake, the 26th overall selection back in 2011. Sitting well at AAA. The Red Sox lost Christian Vasquez, Tommy John surgery, Ryan Hannigan. Hopes to be back around the all-star break, so they're down to a guy they called up probably before they wanted to in Swihart, and he's done a great job handling the pitching staff. The hitting will come, but right now his head's swimming a little bit. Here's the 0-2. Able to wait and get a piece. Yeah, that's a lot on the plate of a young player. To be honest with you, that's an accelerated timetable, as you mentioned, Joe, because of the injuries. John Farrell talking about after games sometimes Blake will say he's exhausted more mentally than physically. There's so much information that has to be distilled in today's game, especially by the catcher. He's trying to get caught up on his own staff, never mind the other hitters. Yeah, I think they overthink it too much, though. At the end of the day, you get a scouting report, you try to execute it, but I, I think we get too worried about, uh-oh, on 2-1, what am I going to throw? Instead of being able to say, here's my pitcher's best stuff tonight, let me get an out. And let's go to work. Uh, they got a scouting report for every hitter, every every situation. It's like, come on, if you got a guy on the mound going like they can, go after somebody. And really, when you talk to John Farrell, that's been the philosophical shift from Juan Nieves 
the former pitching coach to Carl Willis. It's more what's my guy good at as opposed to trying to expose the hitters weakness which is how they were looking at it as a staff and the numbers have picked up not to pick on the because he was the pitching coach when they won it all two years ago. It'll pop up right side and it's the second baseman Giovatella over to make the catch one on one out. Give you our T-Mobile game changer and it's the change to Carl Willis. And what he's done in his career. Pitching coach for three different Cy Young Award winners. He was with the Indians from 2003 through 2009. Part of that time it was John Farrell as the farm director for the Indians and then was the Mariners pitching coach back to the Indians organization. And that's where John Farrell went to go get him. It's relationships. A trusted eye for this pitching staff. The numbers have been better. And the first pitch a strike to Pedroia who struck out his first time. Clean shaven Pedroia. Yeah, he said he made his wife happy with the, that new look. I said, I mean, it had nothing to do with the way this team is struggling. He says, oh, no, we're not superstitious. Here's a ball oh. in the dirt, taking off his hold down to second base. And they're going to argue that the hitter Pedroia impeded the catcher after blocking that ball in the dirt. And you could see just by the body language of James Hoy saying, hey, he's just standing here in the batter's box. Well, they had it again last night. Very similar play. In this too. The difficulty with the call here is the ball in the dirt. If it's a regular ball that's in the air, I understand it. Now you don't have to throw and make contact with the hitter to get that call, but you do have to make some kind of an effort. And the young catcher, a veteran catcher, Mike Sosha, if he was catching, he throws that right off Pedroia and gets the call. Yeah, I don't think Sosha's got much of an argument to win here because Pedroia is taking his normal position. He's not getting in the catcher's way. You're entitled wherever your natural movement is after the pitch to stay there. It's exactly what he did. It's a wild pitch and it allows Holt to go down to second. I mean he doesn't have to vacate here just to make it easier on the catcher. He's not going anywhere. It's a great pickup by the young catcher. It really was. was. Yes. Pretty close. A lot of times that happens after the manager has an argument. You get together while nobody's looking at you and say, hey, pick off right now. That just happened with Socia out there. Chance to tie it for Pedroia. Another good block by Perez. Yeah, you can see why they like this kid. The hands are nice. The short hop, we saw the pick on the pitch before. Right here, the fundamental go down, block it. Then look at his eyes, how quick he's looking for the runner. I mean, this textbook stuff. You know, we were talking, guys, about Victorino making that catch out and right, staggering in the top of this inning. Mookie Betts is in the on deck circle, so it could be more yeah. of an aggravation for that calf or the hamstring for Victorino. Yeah, if you look at the like the second or third step there, you can see it kind of gave away. Here's one into right that will be dropped by Calhoun. Only able to advance to third is holding its first and third one out on a base hit into right by Pedroia. I was talking to Calhoun before the game. I said, how do you make those diving catches out in front of you? That's such a difficult play. I jinxed him. No chance for Holt, who had to make sure that ball wasn't caught before he took off. So that effort by Calhoun and Wright at least... Prevented the run from scoring and now a visit from Mike Butcher the pitching coach out to Wilson with Mookie Betts. We're going to bat for Victorino and we'll go back to that play out in right. Yeah if you watch Shane on this ball right here it's almost a second or third step right here he almost looks like he falls down to the left and regains his, his stride right there you see that little like he stepped in a divot or something and right there is where he blew it away blew it out. What a shame. He was just starting to come back, too.
Kenny, uh, Victorino is a guy that this Red Sox team has been, well, they need him against his left-handed pitching. They now all of a sudden have a surplus of outfielders. Evaluate that situation for us. Joe, they do need him, but Shane Victorino is not the 25-year-old Shane Victorino anymore. He's 34. He's 10 months removed from back surgery. And while his mindset is always go, 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 get out there, he realizes now, and we're seeing it, that his body is going through a transformation. So now first and third one out. The batter is Betts. And he cannot hold up on a pitch in the dirt strike one. Starts him with the slider, back foot slider there. Can't hold up. To me, what's going to be interesting is, are they going to put Betts in right? Or Castillo going to move back over to right field when they get on defense? Here's the 0-1. The report from the Red Sox clubhouse is it is the calf that's grabbed on him again. Left calf tightness. And he had been hitting well since coming off the disabled list. He was on there for a hamstring injury. But out after that play in right. Bet shoots one into left. Tie game. And it gets past the left fielder, Joyce, but he's able to get on top of it and get it back in. It's 2-2 as Mookie Betts delivers the game-tying hit. And right there, C.J. Wilson goes a slide step. And remember, we're talking about how fast he goes. It's going to make the hitter go. He does that quick slide step delivery and delivers a fastball inside. So Mookie Betts is thinking, get the hands through immediately. That ball was rocketed out to bat Joyce. Mookie Betts' hands are just so fast. Very difficult to beat him inside with anything hard. So this has flipped. Now the Red Sox have a tie game. Two on, only one out. And they're three, four hitters coming up. Hanley Ramirez bounced into a double play his first time. Looking for his first RBI of the month. Strike one. There goes the helmet. I don't, I don't. First pitch curveball. Way out in front. Here's the 0 1. Strike two. Here's what I noticed on the first at bat. We we're talking about is Hanley hurt or is he not? The first at bat, he had a 3 1 count, right? I mean, 2 0. -oh. Look at the swing. The helmet flies off everything. And then he gets this ground ball. He swings that double play. To me, he gets one good swing in that bat. He's a guy that has always had that helicopter one hand finish. And that left arm, what he pulls through hard and tries to finish his swing is what he jammed when he crashed into the wall. So, yeah, that's going to take a little while for that to get back. I think it really has affected his swing. Counts 0 and 2. Two on, one out. And a nice play by Perez again. Ball one. I don't know. I can't find anybody in the Red Sox who says this guy is hurt. And again, the, the batting practice show he puts on is just ridiculous swing after swing. I think what's hurt him, and you saw Giovatella position in the middle of the field, the shift. This is a guy who eats, breathes up the middle, a lot of hits. Three years ago, those are hits. Rangers took away three of those, turned them into outs on balls hit hard up the middle. Double play. It wasn't hit especially hard. Probably three or four years ago, that's up the middle for a hit. The shift has worked against him. The one, two. Right back up the middle, and there you go. A flip oh. and safe at second. Although Ibar is going to ask for a replay. I thought Ibar's foot may have gotten on that bag before Mookie Betts got on the bag, and we'll see. Mike Sosha is going to wait, and let's take another look. What a play by Giovatella and Ibar. Ooh. Ibar immediately said to the bench, challenge it. Let's take a look as we slow it down. Nope. This is a tough replay right wow. here. Wow. I think he's out. Oh, he's out. He's out when you do that. Right? No Sosha. I got to take the gamble, right? Yeah, I'm right? surprised there's no challenge there. 
even if you lose it, it's worth it. That's not the neighborhood play at second base either. You can look at that. Now that's a big oh. point in the ball game, a high leverage situation. Yeah, I want you to look at too where the defense plays, David. And here's why I think you got to flip those two around. When he gets in a double play situation, he's got better angles to hit. Other than that, that second base was a deep right field. Ball one to Ortiz. And it changed his whole at bat. Here's another look. Joe, what you think? I think it's close enough that if you're Mike Sosha, you just give it a shot and hope. Yeah, because that angle right there looks like he beat him. Here's a 1 0. Right side. Can they turn two? Pujols out at second. Back to first. Got them both. David Ortiz hits into a brilliantly turned double play from Pujols to Ibar with CJ Wilson covering. That's as good as it gets. And this game stays tied after three. the amazing moments that only happen in Major League Baseball. I don't know if it would be in the category of amazing, but it was certainly a really well-turned double play with Albert Pujols, Ibar, and Wilson with the bases loaded and David Ortiz up to keep it a tie game in the bottom of the third. The knuckleballer brings it. Calhoun takes a strike. Mookie Betts, who hit for Victorino in the game in center now. And that moves Castillo from center to right. Castillo with an error in right last night. And a guy who played on the Cuban national team in center. The one who took over in center for the departed Cespedes. And Martin. Next guy in was Castillo. But here he is in a tough right field at Fenway. Popped up left side. That's Hanley Ramirez trying to learn left. One out and back to the double play. This thing is a symphony, a thing of beauty, three-part symphony. That's a terrific throw by Pujols, a fantastic turn. My favorite part, though, is C.J. Wilson. Look at him. He's already at the bag. A lot of times you see a pitcher get there late where he's not fast enough. He tries to find the ball in the bag at the same time. Watch this hit on first base. He's got the speed and athleticism to set up. This is Albert. I'm, you're not needed on this end of the play. Thank yeah. you. I'll take care of it. Beautiful play. There's David Fries, grounds to third. That's Holt. Two out. Back to that double play, Tom. Great hustle, but get the pitcher out of there. 
That's what I, as a middle infielder, I don't want to throw to him. I don't care if he's standing there waving at me like he's landing an aircraft carrier. If Albert's in the area, get out of the way. Great hustle. It worked out. But I don't want to throw to the pitch. That's why they show up in mid-February in spring training. <laughs> PFPs. For, yes. Showing it off, all those hours of PFP work. Standing for pitcher field position. Very good. I do hate that when we throw all these things act out there and people go, what is that? Well, that's why I said it. I, I know. Mean, pitcher's I fielder's like practice. Whatever it is. <laughs> Same <PFP>. thing. PFP. <laughs> that's what it is. First pitch is outside for a ball to Matt Joyce. Joyce flied out to right his first time up. The word is out that the Angels would love to add a left fielder and a left-handed batter. They had one and a guy named Josh Hamilton. They have one and a guy named Matt Joyce who's trying to pull his batting average up with every at bat and he got on base four times last night he's on here tonight for the first time and let's check in with Ryan Field with a game break Royals won the first game of that set five nothing last night and if Anybody wasn't a believer last October, you have to be now. Kansas City is for real. They're doing it again, and they are doing it with the same formula. They did it in 2014. Yeah, Joe, you know, I was just thinking when I was watching Alex Gordon's home run go out, if the playoffs were to start and the Royals were in, I got to think they're the best team in the American League. Night in, night out. In a playoff situation, I don't know who beats them right now. You better not be behind them after the sixth inning. You're done. It's probably the best defensive team in baseball, the most athletic team in baseball. They don't strike out at all. I call them a great postmodern baseball team. Perez grounds it foul left side and the count nothing and two. And that's such a sad statement. The game's gone that far that we have that many strikeouts and it's okay. You know that this is a postmodern team, but yet you look at the two clubs that were in the World Series last year. They'd probably play the best brand of baseball that's going to give you a chance to win night in, night out. That's the Giants and the Royals. And what do they do? They swing the bat, H. I mean, that's one thing the Red Sox don't do. Struck him out looking, and that's the second of the night for Stephen Wright, who has settled in. We go to the bottom of the fourth inning. Red Sox coming up. We're tied at two.
Tonight's telecast sponsored by Entourage from Warner Brothers Pictures. See the movie in theaters June 3rd. And by Vanda Pharmaceuticals. Bottom of the fourth inning rolls in. Q shot, one out. Off the end of the bat, off the bat of Bogarts, and he's 0 for 2. Bottom of the fourth inning underway in a 2-2 game. And the batter will be Napoli, who homered his first time up. Well, here's what it looked like last time when he came up and he hit the home run. I thought it was an interesting at bat in the second inning. There's a fastball in, curveball in, fastball in. So what's Napoli going to do? I mean, eventually you're going to start looking in as a hitter as well. And he tattooed that ball. So they didn't do a good job of moving him in and out. They continue to pound on his hands. We'll see if they make that adjustment and if he stays the same, this A.B. Only the third home run that C.J. Wilson has allowed this season. Bruce Ney Castillo on deck. Saw a first pitch changeup right there. C.J. shook off three signs to get to that. See, Tom's playing cat and uh, Tom's playing bingo. I'm playing cat and mouse, and Joe's calling the baseball game. If we uh, updated our little bingo card here, do we know how many squares he's hit? B I N G O. I like the bingo music. Hopefully, we get the music with the updated card. Uh, well, we'll put it through this A B. We'll see what happens. Oh, I'm looking for Napoli to go deep again. Ouch. Count goes to three and out. Here comes the bingo music, Tom. Look at that card already, guys. Wow. I thought that was a game for old folks. Bingo! We're going to have a 90-year-old woman run out at the end <laughs> if he gets all of them. There's a strike three and one. And again, if you weren't with us earlier and you're wondering what in the world that is, those are the different <laughs> velocities that C.J. Wilson has hit since the beginning of this game. Through his 68 pitches, here comes number 69 on three and one. A one out walk. Second walk handed out by Wilson. Well, I told CJ yesterday we were going to play speed bingo with him. He was excited about it, actually. I don't know if he's a big bingo fan or not, but he's certainly a fan of changing speeds. And he told me, just make sure, keep an eye on the radar gun readings in this ballpark. Because he, again, he analyzes everything. He said the radar gun here being closer to home plate with the smaller stadium adds one mile an hour to his pitches. He doesn't miss anything. How does that work? The mound's still 60 feet, 6 inches. But the guns in the stands are a little farther away than, say, in a place like Oakland or Anaheim. Hmm. Interesting. One on, one out for Castillo, who takes a strike over the outside corner. The 27-year-old outfielder, Cuban-born. And it was a massive layout with cash by the Red Sox, not just for Castillo, but for Joan Moncada. A young switch hitting power hitting infielder that is now just starting his professional career in single A baseball. He is supposed to be legit. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting a chance to see him. I really thought, Tom, that was a player the Yankees needed to get. The Red Sox are getting all these young players and turning it over, and the Yankees are still continually getting. Free agents, big league free agents, but they're older. And try finding a kid like that in the draft. 19 years old, six foot one, probably 210 pounds. Runs better than Castillo, actually faster than him. 135 plus million dollar payout by this organization for those two Cuban players. Wow. You know, a lot of these organizations sign somebody to a deal like that and they expect finished products. It was the same for Castillo that's been with a lot of guys where they come to these organizations and they haven't played for a while. He got up to the big leagues late last year, got 10 games with the Red Sox, but prior to last year, his last full season in Cuba was the 2012-2013 season. Same for Moncada. 
That's off the end of the bat. Wilson off the mound, only played a first two out. Yeah, you know what's interesting about that, Joe? When you said his age, he's 27, right? You're thinking Yasiel Puig. You know, when he's 22 years old and he's making an all-star team. But these guys are a little bit older at 27, 28, and breaking in. But as I look back through history of baseball and you start thinking about, you know, Jackie Robinson was 28. You know, if you can give me a guy 26 to 35 and be productive, I'll take that 10-year stretch of guys being able to do some things at 25, 35 years. We get spoiled when you see Mike Trout at 21 and 22 and Bryce Harper at 22 now doing what he's doing. It doesn't happen all the time. Go ahead, run at second for Holt. He takes a pitch low for ball one. Talk about the value of a guy who can play all over the place. Amazing. These are just games this season. Where's his 70 million? <laughs> <laughs> Here's a 1 0. He leans back from ball two from Wilson with the rookie catcher Swihart on deck. So I, asked, I had to ask him how many gloves he carries. He really only has two. He uses the same infield glove at second, short, and third, the same outfield glove, of course, in any outfield position. And if, it, if he's at first base, he borrows Mike Napoli's mitt. Looking to put Boston on top here in the fourth inning. I find it interesting is they're basically saying, you know what, he's not beating me. Even left on left, they were looking at Swihart and saying, you know what, kid, until you hit, we're going to continue to go after you even with the left-hander hitting in front of you. That open base at first. Here comes a 3-0. There's a strike, 3-1. I was just going to say, I'm giving him the green light right there. I thought he might be swinging. A one-out walk to Napoli. He's at second with two out. Here's a 3-1 to Holt. On the outside corner, full count. What's the count, Joe? Full count. I said just start the count three and two when he steps in the box. The commissioner would approve of that, pace a game and all that. It's amazing how many times he gets the full counts. Pace a game, by the way, is down by nine minutes overall from a year ago. It's all right. Three, two. Got him. Ran the count to 3-0 and, oh and came all the way back and got him with a 3-2 breaking ball. Bingo music to break. Fifth inning at Fenway Park. Tied to two.
Ten days of thunder caps off tomorrow with the return of Sprint Cup racing as the world's best drivers take on the circuit's most grueling race at the Coca-Cola 600. Coverage begins 5.30 Eastern only on Fox and streaming live on Fox Sports Go. Here is Mark Krause, the DH, and this is a team that has gotten one home run out of the DH spot all year. Wow. That's why they're looking for help for this lineup because if you thought the Angels started the year with not enough pitching, I think they've proven here over the first couple of months that they may have enough and they have some guys in the upper levels of the minor leagues they like a lot. But the offense is down and they need some left handed presence in this lineup. Well, you look at the offense the Angels had, what, two years ago? Was Trumbo there two years ago? So you had. Mm, I'm going to say no. I think three years. No, a little ago. farther back. Howie three Kendrick, years. of course, traded for Andrew Heaney, the young pitcher. I agree with you, Joe. They're a bat short somewhere in this lineup. I mean, Hamilton was banged up last year, but this was an Angels lineup that led baseball in runs per game. And now they're down at 3.88 runs per game coming in. That's the lowest for the Angels since 1992. It's off the end of the bat. Foul territory. Holt is over. Has a play. One out. We did a quick interview with John Farrell, manager of the Red Sox. And the first question was about the way his knuckleballer has settled into this game. Yeah, you know, Joe, early on, a couple of knuckleballs that stayed up, to, you know, they did a good job with some fly balls to right center field, left center field, but uh, a lot of strikes and, and giving himself a chance. And you gave Mookie Betts the night off to start. You also sided the left-hander. You get an injury, so there's Mookie Betts, and he hits a rocket to tie the game. That's just the way baseball works. <laughs> yeah, you know, we, we talked about it before the game where some struggles against some left-handed pitching has been there for us, but uh, unfortunately, Vic has been battling some calf issues and started to tighten up after he sprinted down the line the first inning, so Mookie gets a key hit in, a, in that two-run inning. All right. Thanks for the time, John. Okay, guys. Third year as manager here with the Red Sox, a world champion two years ago. Here's the 0-1 pitch. Giovatella pops it up right side. Well, he's got a lot of pop-ups with that knuckleball. It's out number two. Ken Rosenthal, it's an interesting story with Stephen Wright, how he got to this spot as a knuckler. Joe, his motto is, if you've got a jersey, you've got a chance, and his career is living proof. 2011, he's 26 years old. He's heading for his fourth straight year of double-A. Now, he had dabbled with the knuckleball, and the Indians had Tom Candiotti, the old knuckleballer, take a look at him, and he said, hey, make this guy a knuckleballer. Well, Wright kind of resisted the idea, but eventually he went to see Charlie Huff with the Dodgers. He was in Dodgers camp at the time. Went to Dodgers camp, through a bullpen in his Indians uniform, <laughs> learned the pitch, kind of master the pitch as best you can. By 2012, at the deadline, he gets traded to the Red Sox. And at the end of that season, he told his wife, listen, I was drafted second round 2006. If I don't get added to the 40-man roster or have a club select me in the Rule 5 draft, I'm done. He got added to the 40-man roster, and here he is rolling. And here he is rolling indeed. He gave up two in the first. It's a 2-2 game into the bottom of the fifth. Stephen Wright doing his part here on a great night at Fenway Park. Tied at two.
Sponsored by Chevrolet. Find new roads. Bottom of the fifth inning. Swihart first up. They'll be followed by Pedroia and then Mookie Betts. 2-2 two, two the score. Steve Horn, who is our editorial consultant and resident genius, looked it up, and you were right, Harold. Two years ago, Trumbo was with the Angels. One out as Swihart's 0 for 2. Yeah, and you had Trumbo. He's hitting his 30 Trump bombs. You had Albert, and you had uh, the Hamilton. Name, Hamilton, you know, and then you look at the rest of the stuff, and Trout, we didn't even mention him. So that's some thunder in the lineup. And you get rid of Kendrick, who was in that lineup as well. So you look at what's happened to this lineup in just two years. Yeah, but back then, even two years ago, the pitching was woefully short. Yes. Pitching is much better here in 2015. And at the knees from Wilson to Pedroia, strike one. See, because Steve Horn backed me, he's a stud. <laughs> uh huh. Stud, man. It's my guy now. It's Pedroia now. It's Mookie Betts on deck. One ball, one strike. Nice moment last night for Garrett Richards. I'm sure the right hander wanted to turn in an even better outing, but he got the win last night in the ballpark where his season and his knee blew up last August. Boy, and the Angels season went right with it. Left side. To his left, a bobble, but a play by Freeze. Two out. Tell you, Joe, you were talking about pace of game. Uh, the game tonight at least looks a lot more crisp. You know, the pitchers are working, CJ's motion, the guys are making plays. It's just a better game. Yeah, and I think that's part of CJ's new MO as well. Defense has played better behind him. I truly believe dictating pace is not just a gain advantage over a hitter. Well, you know, Harold, defense behind you appreciates that. More likely to make plays in a quicker paced game. Here's Betts. He took over for Shane Victorino and in his only at bat tonight, tied it with a sharp base hit in the left. Then the Red Sox loaded the bases with one out. But David Ortiz bounced into a well turned 3 6 1 double play. Pool holes to Ibar to Wilson to end the threat. Here's a 1 1 with two out. Mm. Two and one. Did you used to do that when you were playing? The guy's going to get hit? Yeah. Mm. Ah! Scream when it's coming at me. Ah! I think you're safer up here, H. It wasn't ah! It was ah! <laughs> Here's a 2 1 from Wilson. Hard hit, what a pick by Freeze. Hello, what a play. And we go to the sixth. Betts couldn't have hit it any harder. And what a pick by David Freeze at third. All that work with Gary G. Sarcina paying off. The kid, the man, the stud, the MVP coming up, tied at two.
There's only one stadium, only one left for Mike Trout that he has not conquered with a home run ball as we go into the sixth. That's in the American League, obviously with limited work going through the National League. But only one AL park is left, and it's right here at Fenway. Hey, it's not like he doesn't love hitting here. 392 career coming into tonight. In the air to right, back at the track. There for the outcast steal, one pitch, one out. Yeah, that's an amazing graphic for the fact that he's only played this his fourth year. You think about it, guys sometimes play 10, 15 seasons and don't do what he's already done in every ballpark. But Trevor Griff was what the 17th season and he hit one, and it was like he's hit one in every stadium now. Right. <laughs> right. But watching him in batting practice, there are just a few guys around baseball that. That can be as fun as watching a game just to see what somebody can do and just punish a baseball and this guy hit a ball at the end of his round of batting practice today that left this park out by the American flag and left the stadium entirely up to try and hammer it as Pujols long throw wide but out out of the hand of Bogarts two down. Here we're going to make David Freeze happy. We're going to talk about Mike Trout for three hours, and why not? In my opinion, he's the best in the game. He does it all. Yeah, really. The kryptonite was supposedly the throwing arm. Well, he conquered that above-average thrower now. And then last year, you heard about well, he can't hit the high fastball. Well, he covered that. Harold, what's left? Go out and see him. That's what's <laughs> left. Don't just watch him on TV. You, you can't appreciate him until you see him in person. Really, I mean. The speed of him, the game, so different in person. Calhoun takes a strike. It reminds me a lot of Derek Jeter when you had to watch the Yankees in the playoffs and you saw him every day and you went, wow, he does something every day. And then you recognize the greatness of a player, and that's Mike Trout every day. It's just an atypical baseball body. Tom, you and I were behind the cage. He looks like Luke Keekley to me, the, the great middle linebacker with the Carolina Panthers. He is just a rock. I, I told you that was a great comp. Because, you know, facially, he does remind you of Mantle a little bit, right? He's so much bigger than when Mickey Mantle played that he, you do have to compare him to an NFL player. He's, he's massive. And like the guy you called teammate Ken Griffey Jr. especially when he first came up what I love about Trout more than any of it is he looks like he's actually having fun playing baseball. Yeah he really does. I, I, I always smiling. But I guess you know hey he's what is he 23 yet? Yeah he's 23 years old. Got 144 million. I'm smiling <laughs> yeah, too. No, that's that's I'm a pretty good. Smiling point. too. Hitting 300 every. Yeah, that's not many long nights there. With two out, Calhoun gets under it into center. Mookie Betts stalks it. And another one, two, three inning for Stephen Wright. Bottom of the sixth inning here at Fenway. Still tied at two.
the 2015 Esurance MLB All-Star Game ballot for the 2015 All-Star Game in Cincinnati. Vote at MLB.com slash vote. Get all of the excitement. It's the 86th All-Star Game, July 14th, live on Fox. And two guys you will no doubt see, Nelson Cruz, what a great first year in Seattle. Felix Hernandez doing it again. The Red Sox beat him on their last trip. But these are two guys that are stalking the Triple Crown in their various lines of work. Felix Hernandez on the mound and Nelson Cruz at the plate. Strike one on Hanley Ramirez. Bottom of the sixth inning, 2-2 game. Ramirez, Ortiz, and Bogarts. The hitters for Boston. Tom, I thought it was interesting looking at the defense where they played perfectly, as you had said, in the shift, and now he's not behind second base anymore. He got two balls hit to him. I mean, he makes his living up the middle. That's where he prefers to go. Two and one. Don't you go stand back there again if he hit the ball there, Joe? Well, you would. <laughs> yes. I don't care what the dugout's saying. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> That's a serious piece of jewelry around the neck of C.J. Wilson. 2-1 pitch is fouled back. 2-2. Two and two. You got that on the trip to Brazil. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> I'm just playing. I was going to say, it's a, it's a nice little nugget you came up with. <laughs> Isn't that a little bit too big? It'd slap you in the face every time you move. Yeah. There are the numbers tonight for Wilson, who comes in 2-2. Two and two. Good ERA. Coming off a rough outing, he misses inside, and it's a full count on Hanley Ramirez. Really interesting sequence here. He has attacked him with fastballs the entire at bat. And let's check out the jewelry right here. There's a lot flying there, H. Yeah, it hits him all right. Out in front of it and onto the ground goes that helmet yet again. Yeah, you knew there was a breaking ball in his back pocket somewhere in this sequence. Just got a piece. Ouch. Helmets dropping, jewelry's flying. I'm going to say that's a gift from the wife or somebody. I'm going to say that's expensive. I know that. Look at that <laughs> shine. I'm going to say is, he can afford it. That is some bling. A leadoff walk, and that's walk number three handed out by C.J. Wilson in a tie game. Tonight's telecast sponsored by Jeep Grand Cherokee, the most rewarding SUV ever. And by Lowe's, Lowe's never stop improving. Well, here's Ortiz. That streak is in jeopardy, and he had a perfect chance last time up. Tie game, bases loaded one out and bounced into a double play. They're starting to make some moves out in the bullpen for the Angels. Ball one. I'm real curious what happens with this at bat because CJ has been navigating through the lineup and he's got Ortiz on a couple ground ball double plays already. Hanley had some good swings. So you got to come back and try to keep him in the park right here and minimize this inning. This is a big at bat. On deck is Bogarts. Here's a 1 0. In at the knees, pulled up by Perez, the catcher, a ball and a strike. Had a long conversation, Tom, about that. We'll get into it in a bit. Here's a 1 1. Ball two. Just yeah. about the strike zone and how it continues to get lower and lower. 
instead of losing the high strike and continuing to get low. I don't know if that was a conversation. David did all the talking. <laughs> At this point, what I asked him, I said, where is it bigger? And he said, not just lower, but also higher, also inside, also outside. And he said the pitchers have more stuff, and he's noticed in the last two years, the combination of more stuff, shifts, and a bigger strike zone. C.J. Wilson said, what happened to my strike zone right there? He wanted that one. Counts three and one. Well, this is such a big pitch because you're, you're possibly 2-2 two, two, or you're down 3-1. Yelling out of James Hoy, the home plate umpire. 3-1, Ortiz gets under it and flies it into shallow right. Calhoun is there, and the frustration for David Ortiz continues 0 for 3. A big swing and just got under it. Love to have that pitch back. One on, one out. Well, you said it, Joe. He got the 3-1 pitch he wanted. Got to run, David. Yeah, it did sound like he broke his bat on that. It's a big out for C.J. Wilson with Morin getting loose. Here's Bogarts with Napoli to follow. Xander 0 for 2. Just 22 years old from Aruba, and it starts to feel like he's back to where he was early last year. There goes the runner. Hit and run was on. Strike one. Sure was. Got a good pitch to work that way, too. I like it though to see the action trying to force something to happen. And, and, and here's David Ortiz a little snapping that bat. That's a strong man right there. You break the bat. I don't care if it's cracked a little or not. It's raining in Kansas City where the Royals lead the Cardinals three to two in the fifth inning. So we'll bring that audience into Fenway Park. Good one here. Game two of this three game set. Angels won last night 12 to five to two. Bottom of the sixth inning. Here's the 0 one to Xander Bogarts. Instead of check on Ramirez. The Angels got two runs in the first inning. Driven in by Cole Calhoun on a two run double. But since then the knuckleballer Stephen Wright has settled in. He's been brilliant. And on the other side, C.J. Wilson gave up a home run to Napoli in the second, an RBI base hit by Mookie Betts in the third. Trying to get around a leadoff walk here in the sixth. Ouch. Strike two. See, I, I... That's what I said, brought to you by Budweiser. There it is. A little game summary. No bingo yet, Joe. No I guess, bingo. I guess they're playing full card bingo. Well, for those joining us from the Kansas City St. Louis game, Tom has brought with him the bingo card to chart the different velocities of C.J. Wilson during the course of the night. Runner goes and a fly ball into center. Ramirez will have to retreat. That's out number two, and C.J. Wilson is one out away from getting around a leadoff walk and. With the bingo card comes the brutal music. The bingo represents, for those that just joined us from the other game, the different speeds that C.J. Wilson has been able to use in this game. And this is a Tom Verducci thought-out game a long time ago. So he's gone from 76 at the low to 93 at the high. And what happened to 80? we got to get 80 there. I didn't think he was getting up to 94 and 95, but we had to fill out the card. Pretty impressive, though. Here's Napoli. He hit a laser home run his first time up. Just crushed it into left. He smoked it. And you know what? I'm thinking about the Red Sox offense and how anemic it's been. You've got to have Napoli or Hanley behind David Ortiz if you want to get things going. You can't have your five hitter with a hit and run on the first pitch and think you're going to score runs and have Ortiz get pitches to hit. It's not going to happen. 
But I, I think, Tom, where we were going earlier is for the Red Sox, this is it. I mean, if these guys don't hit, the Red Sox aren't going to win. If Mike Napoli doesn't click it in like he did back in the second, and forget just the raw power, but come up with hits and get the average above 200, Ortiz doesn't hit left-handers, they're in trouble. And H, I think more swings like that home run we saw from Mike Napoli. Yeah, ideally, you do want to stack those big power hitters. Ramirez, Ortiz, Napoli. Xander Bogarts gets the spot because John Farrell telling us lately he's had a little more leverage in his swing. Maybe juice one off the monster or over it. Now I think you're absolutely right. You need to get back to the original intention of the three power hitters lined up. Well, obviously, Pablo Sandoval's not in the lineup. That, that lengthens it. But as an opposing pitcher... I'm a little more worried with with Napoli or Ramirez behind Ortiz than I am Bogarts. And Bogarts can run into 15 of them if he wants to. I'm still worried about the other guys. And so I think David's not going to get much to hit until you have that threat of that power guy that can beat you with a two or three run homer sitting right behind him. Three balls and a strike on Napoli. Sandoval out with a bone bruise on his left knee hit by pitch on Tuesday. No starts since, but he is available tonight, according to John Farrell. Here's a 3-1. There it goes in the left. He's got his second of the night all the way out of here, off the bat of Napoli. And maybe it's turned for number 12. It's 4-2 Red Sox on top. Well, Joe, we've seen him hit the fastball, and now we've watched him hit a breaking ball. The fastball was a linea into the seats and left, and this breaking ball he crushed. I mean, smoked. Only question is, did that hit a car? <laughs> Parked or moving? Ooh, mercy. That's where it landed. It went over that side. No, the other one. <laughs> that thing was just destroyed. Watch the load with the hands. See him getting back behind him. That's the mm. biggest difference. And that when it, ball is just going to go into orbit. When you're that strong and you get that kind of a load with your hands. You imagine a long rubber band between your front foot and your hands. And you stretch it to get that separation. And then you snap it with that swing. Now, I got to think that's, that Napoli used to catch C.J. when they played together in Texas. Sure. He actually had bad numbers coming in against C.J. 194 lifetime until today. You wouldn't know it with the two swings we've seen. Counts three and one on Castillo for two. One for six since his call up from AAA. And Carlos Perez is going to go out and talk. And this is coming from the bench. And this is so they can get a left-hander up in the event he gets the halt. Well, he's got 112 pitches. This and is this is how quick it can get away from you. This is the last hitter either way right here. Somebody's phone's ringing. Bullpen phone. That was in the bullpen. Get the lefty up. It's Ramos. Here's a 3-1. Back to Wilson. Off his glove. He can't make the play. Oh, don't get hurt. And his night is going to end on that play, it would appear. Yeah, the last thing you want to do is have CJ get hurt on this play right here. It's a long season ahead. But Joe, he's made some athletic plays, though, huh? He really has. We saw it early. And we see it here. And we'll see if he gets to stay in to face Holt. And even with the left-hander Ramos up, they're going to stick with C.J. Wilson, it appears. 113 pitches, and with Brock Holt in the box, I guess you have to add six, right? <laughs> yeah. We'll throw over to give that reliever in the pen a little extra time. 
Now, Brock Holt, Tom, you've been talking about it, goes to 3-2 count. And I, I felt like last time he had 3-0, 3-1, took fastballs, got a breaking ball because the guy on deck is not hitting right now. And he's got to know that. This is going to be the last guy I think he faces, Joe. You agree with that? Well, I, I thought that was the case with Castillo when they hurried to get the left-hander ready for Holt. But I don't know that Ramos is ready. If you're Brock Holt, you've got a pitcher out there whose night is now a long one. Take advantage as the count's gone to 2-0. and oh. And he's up to 115 pitches. Well, I think since it's four to two now, you want Ramos not to go to one hitter, but be able, he's a guy that's going to have to give you an in inning or two so you don't get to your main guys in the pen. He's going to have to give you some length now in this game. So, Harold, would you want to see Brock Holt take a shot here, two and oh? Keyhole fastball and be aggressive here. Oh, absolutely. Unless you feel like Swihart from the right hand side. He's going to get a shot at the next guy, but I think he's going to get a fastball. He's got to know he's going to get one. The fan just dropped the baseball out of the warning track in center. Trout went and got it, threw it into the shortstop, Ibar, who threw it to the third base coach, Brian Butterfield, who then turned around and threw it to a fan by the dugout. So the fan just basically <laughs> handed his baseball to somebody in the dugout area seats. Here's a 2-0. 3-0. -0. Get the fan who dropped it a tissue. <laughs> that ball's gone. They're thinking, hey, I'll throw it down Trow to get it. Maybe he'll sign it for yeah. me. <laughs> you know, CJ hasn't thrown too many pitches that are a ball directly out of his hand. But the last three, that was the case. Why not swing here on three and oh? Right down the middle, three and one. I think they'll probably be sending the runner right here, and he may get a fastball and hope he can shoot one in the gap. It was a 3 0 count his last time up, and he got the feeling that CJ Wilson was happy to pitch around Brock Holt, and he came back and got him. Joe, so they're dropping balls out of the stands like they're falling from the sky. Yeah, another one just got sent back in toward the dugout. Here comes a 3-1 pitch. Runner goes. Fouled away. You were right, and we may get it again. We know we'll get the runner going on a 3-2 count. Will Holt get the same pitch? He did not get a 3-2 fastball his last time up. No, and I think if I'm C.J. Wilson, I'm throwing him another slider. And if I miss, oh, well, I'm out of the game. If I get him, I did what I needed to do. I'm out of the game. But I don't give in here. You know, he's not being held by Albert. He hits the ball in the gap. He scores. Runner will go. And a strikeout ends the night. C.J. Wilson gets the strikeout. That's his sixth of the night. But it's Napoli. 77 mile per hour pitch and it's Napoli who says bingo his second of the night for two socks into the seventh back after this from your local Fox station.
started. As Napoli, the guy on the right, has taken him deep twice. What were the odds you would have given that Stephen Wright would be working the seventh and C.J. Wilson would not? But Stephen Wright lost in all of this. He's retired 17 of the last 18 batters he's faced. Two runs in the first and settled in. I would have never thought that was going to happen. That's a strike, a ball and a strike on David Freeze, 0 for 2, who took the knuckleballer R.A. Dickey that he faced on Thursday deep in Toronto. Joyce on deck. Now the Angels down by two in the count one and two on Freeze. He presents a different problem than most knuckleballers because he throws it so much harder. You, you, you think knuckleball, you think 68 miles an hour, 70. It's almost like batting practice. We used to have Bobby Cuellar and different guys come throw knuckleballs, coaches that would throw them. Can't really duplicate this. He throws it so hard. Well, you get the other end of the spectrum with Ogando getting loose. Big right-hander. Good velocity. Fly ball into center. Back to get it is Betts. One out in the seventh inning for Stephen Wright. Well, now it's getting unfair. That was a changeup knuckleball. Dropped from 79 to 66 and looked like Freeze was bored waiting for that pitch to arrive. And you saw the stat before. That's now 12 fly ball outs in this game by Stephen Wright. A lot of those weak contact. Take a little bit off the knuckler. Watch David out in front of it. You know, that's straight out of the Charlie Huff book, too. It's basically, I know I got to throw a strike. I'm going to give you one here, but I'm not going to give in. Well, five innings, that's what Stephen Wright went his last time out Sunday at Seattle. And after the game, he said, I can go tomorrow. I can go in two days, whatever John Farrell needs. Before the game, you, Harold, basically had to say, okay, Stephen, I got to get up and, and go do the game. And yeah. Kenny, I know he was talking to Kenny down there an hour before the game. This guy is relaxed. Sure is. Talking about. Uh... Well, guys, the normal baseball custom is that the starting pitcher doesn't talk to media the day of the game. A number of starting pitchers don't talk to media the day before they pitch. So this guy is quite relaxed. Three and one. It's refreshing. It really is. I wish the other guys would take a page out of Stephen Wright's book. This Stephen Wright, not the comedian. 3 2. As that one just caught the outside corner, and Wright gets the benefit of the doubt on that pitch. And just in case our viewers were wondering, right? Because Stephen Wright, the stand up comic, is from Massachusetts. <laughs> Did not have a career change, folks. No. He had a great delivery. It just was so low key. <laughs> there he is on the right. How do you tell if you're out of invisible ink? What is the speed of dark? If 7-Elevens open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, why are there locks on the doors? That's it. If you throw a knuckleball, <laughs> why do they say you have a key to the batting box? He takes a catcher's glove with him. <laughs> Swihart gets the real one now. What a job by Stephen Wright. And in a two-run game. He takes his act to the dugout, and Ogando comes in out of the pen. One on, one out.
A little check swing foul ball right side, and Ogando is welcomed into this game. It's a 4-2 score, Boston on top, one-on-one -on -one out top of the seventh inning, and the batter is Carlos Perez, the young rookie catcher. And that's the swing you get when you've seen a knuckleball all night, 93 comes at you. 93 from a weird arm angle. Throws it straight out of his shoulder, and the count one ball, one strike, and now they must have called a balk. That's interesting. I, I didn't quite see that. But it sends Joyce down to second with one on. Let's take another look. The only thing I'm thinking is they said he didn't give a discernible stop, but I don't I don't see it anywhere. Well, you don't see that called very often, but it's a balk. So here in the seventh inning, a base hit makes it a one run game as Carlos Perez 0 for two weights. A little more of a pause this time, and he went around, no doubt. They had to appeal anyway in the count 0 and 2. When a guy knows in the game, you will see some funky swings from right handed hitters, usually on the slider. That's on the fastball. Runner at second, one out in the 0 2 pitch. Ball one outside. Well, he still hasn't got to that form he had in Texas coming off the uh, arm injury that he had. So he's still building back up. And a lot of times we don't see guys really turn the corner until the second half of the year. He's been getting hit pretty hard early in the season. They really like what they have with their back two guys in the bullpen here. There's a strikeout on a pitch up around the chin, two out. It is. Next week, MLB on Fox Sports 1 returns. Diamondbacks take on Milwaukee at 4 Eastern. Then at 7, baseball night in America. We will be in St. Louis. The Dodgers take on the Cardinals. A couple of first place clubs at the moment, or these Red Sox square off against the Rangers or the Royals take on the Cubs. Coverage begins next Saturday on your home for baseball every Saturday, Fox and Fox Sports 1. Strike one to Mark Krause, who is 0 for 2. I mean, all fastballs here. The 94 must look like 104 after Stephen Wright. Reminds me back when Terry Francona in the rotation liked to slot Tim Wakefield behind or between Pedro Martinez and Kurt Schilling. A couple of right handers getting loose for the Angels. Morin and Salas. That's outside, one and one. Well, that was a genius move by Terry. I, it's between Schilling and Pedro. I think it Tom could have slotted between those two guys. <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty good. Oh, and rather 0 for 2 is Kraus and now 0 for 3. Going to the bag to make the play is the man of the hour, Mike Napoli. He's hit two home runs tonight. 4-2. Time to stretch at Fenway Park.
Budweiser. Budweiser still brewed the hard way. This Bud's for you. And by C. Alice. In honor of Memorial Day weekend, Fox Sports proudly supports Folds of Honor and its mission of providing educational scholarships to families of military members who have been killed or disabled while serving our country. For more information, please visit foxsportsports.com. Here's Morin taking over for C.J. Wilson, who went six, allowed four runs on seven hits, struck out six, walked three, two home runs, and a wild pitch. Swihart first up. Took a ball now another. It's 2-0. Oh. Yeah, the difficulty of facing Mike Morin is the difference in velocity. He can run that fastball up at 93, 94, and an excellent changeup about 20 miles an hour slower. But it's 3-0. Oh. Not giving much on the corners, but he's been consistent all night that way. We haven't seen a lot of guys arguing balls that are you know, two or three inches off the plate. They throw another ball out on the field. Now there's another ball, yeah. Out in right center. Incredible. I'm gonna I'm going to just guess that one got away from the bullpen. As Junichi Tazawa gets loose. He's been terrific this year for Boston. That's outside a four pitch walk not a good start to the inning. And we'll welcome you inside our broadcast booth on baseball night in America. I'm Joe that's Harold that's Tom and. Uh, we saw a really good start tonight from Stephen Wright. I, I you have to come away impressed with everything that Napoli's done Wright deserves a ton of credit. No I mean it was impressive he gives up two runs early and you're thinking uh oh he's in trouble. And he just settled down, wiped him out basically. And this time, the big blow behind him, the two run homer by Napoli, supporting the strong starting pitching. Throw down by Perez, trying to get Swihart wandering too far, did not. Why do the catchers always try to pick each other off? Mm. You ever notice that? Good point. Maybe you're thinking the legs are a little heavy at the end of a long game, hard to get back. Could be. Or they're talking about you too much. They're going to start talking about me. <laughs> Pedroia waits for the 0 1. 0 and 2. Yeah, I think they want to check on more in here. I think that was the issue. Something here Ooh. on that last pitch caught the attention of Mike Socia and the staff. And he's not sending the trainer or Socia back. Looked like when he started to walk around the circle, he's grabbing his hip beside the oblique. I never knew what an oblique was. I actually think it might have been a pitch before Oof. Johnny Giovatella had gone in just Oof. to check on him. And that didn't look good. And they're going to take him right out of the game. So Morin's out. And back into the bullpen go the Angels. As a left hander who was up earlier, Cesar Ramos will come in. Morin is out as we play here in the bottom of the seventh for two socks.
15 FIFA Women's World Cup begins as the nation rallies behind Alex Morgan and Team USA who are in search of their third title while taking on the world's best teams. The only place you can see the Women's World Cup is Fox and Fox Sports 1. It all begins on June 6th. It's Vinny Pestano who's taken over. We showed you that Ramos was up, but getting up cold off the bullpen bench is Pestano, so he has as long as he needs to get ready. And you were right, Tom. It was the pitch before the last one by Morin that got him. First pitch to Pedroia. Look at him already grabbing his side. G. Vitella asked him how he was. He decides to stay in the game, but look, you can see the obvious pain. Mm. On the second one, tried to pitch through that. Probably not a great idea. And you just hope that doesn't turn out to be one of those dreaded obliques. Yeah, you know what's interesting about that is that's a guy who probably hasn't been hurt a whole lot because what, what I've been watching is like Tula Whiskey a few weeks ago running down the baseline and he felt the cramp stopped immediately. This guy's been hurt a lot. Victorino tonight with the calf. Okay, I'm coming out. You know, when you start to feel that, you can kind of T cut back maybe your time on the injured list or something like that. Well, right now, the difference in the game is this from Mike Napoli. Three one. Yeah. It came in at 77. It exited at 110. And traveled about 450 feet. Yeah, I, I like that right there with stat cast because a lot of times we think about exit velocity, but if a guy's throwing 95 and you turn one around and you hit it 100, oh, well, big deal. That's a pitch that you provided the power with, and you get a real good reading of, of the exit velocity in which Napoli had to provide that power on the breaking ball. Well, more importantly, it shows the Red Sox are squaring up some balls. I mean, that has not been happening. I know a lot of people have said the Red Sox offense have been unlucky because their batting average on balls and play is so low. But when you do look at exit velocity, it will tell you how hard, or in the Red Sox case, <laughs> how soft you're hitting the baseballs. They have not been hitting in tough luck. They've not been hitting well until Napoli looks like by himself he wants to change direction of where this offense is going. Napoli hit a home run his first time up in the second. A two-run shot to put the Red Sox on top. Now Pestano gets a swing and a miss from Pedroia, and Pestano will get that strikeout for out number one. And Pedroia is Pestanoed off because of the fact that he had to face a new pitcher with two strikes on him. You get a little bit of a read, but more end than you get the break. He gets all the warm up he wants, and then you chase the pitch. Pistano, did you like that? Uh, that was good. Yeah, same. Just saying. So Pedroia's one for four. Now Mookie Betts, who initially was getting the night off just to kind of rest and reboot, and then aggravating a strained left calf was Shane Victorino early in this game. So Mookie came off the bench. Hit for him in the third, tied the game with a base hit into left. He's hit the ball hard twice, one for two. The 1 0. It's down the right field line. And a play, but a drop by Calhoun. That ball stayed playable, and Cole Calhoun got near that little wall down the right field line and just missed it. Well, you, you, you said it right. He just missed it. The ball, if we were watching earlier, it's funny from the vantage point we have in the, in the press box, you can see the wind push balls away from guys. The foul ball that, that Brock Holt caught, I almost felt like yelling to him, back up, you know, because we were able to see it. And as you get to the corners, the ball pushes back once you get above the roof here at Fenway. He just missed it. It's an error on Calhoun. It's two on one out. And a chance for Hanley Ramirez. Those fans know how to react down that right field line the second that Calhoun <laughs> couldn't make that catch. They were on him in a blink. Well, listen, he's a very good defensive outfielder, but that is the most difficult right field in all of baseball. And yeah, the fans add to the degree of difficulty. Two on one out. Ramirez takes a strike. Pistano's working in only his fifth game of the month of May. It's 
See the lack of foul territory. That uh, Calhoun knew he was running out of room quickly. Here is an 0 1. Strike two. It's a good swing for Hanley. We, we, we haven't, you were talking about him hitting balls up the middle, Tom. That's a ball that's going to right field. And that's the Hanley Ramirez that we saw a lot in LA shooting that ball the other way. Yeah, you saw by his reaction, he had a good pitch to hit. He wanted that one. Here's an 0-2. Tom, you and I were taken by the bounce in the step of Hanley Ramirez before this game. Messing around with the fans on the field and signing autographs, taking pictures. That's got a lot to do with David Ortiz, Joe. I remember early in spring training, John Farrell telling me, if you saw one, you saw the other. They were attached at the hip throughout spring training. Another 0 2 from Pestano. Hard hit left side. Under the glove of Ibar. They're going to hold the runner at third. That's Swihart. And the bases are loaded. You know, the first thing I was thinking was on Ibar, you dive for that ball, but that's understanding you're playing in Fenway Park. You're only going to make this play if you stay on your feet to throw somewhere. And Fenway, with the wall being so short, they're not going to score. And so you try to go ahead and take that extra step. Maybe I can catch it and make a throw. Because he's talking to David Freeze right now. I was coming to you right there if he catches that ball. Associates out. Ramos will be coming in out of the bullpen here with the left handed hitting and struggling against left handed pitching. D.H. David Ortiz coming up. Another chance for Big Poppy with the bases loaded when we come back. Team and players all season with MLB.com at bat, the number one app for live baseball at bat is up to the moment. At any moment with in-game highlights, live look-ins, replay reviews, radio broadcast, stat cast, and more. Get MLB.com at bat now. Third time in this series, up with the bases loaded for David Ortiz. He's facing Cesar Ramos. He is struck out and hit into a double play in this spot so far in this series. Ball one. Every manager goes into a game knowing the matchups that he wants. Mike Sosha wants this matchup. Ortiz one for 15 against Ramos. I'm not sure Mike Sosha wanted it with the bases loaded in less than two outs. And that's why when it got to a certain point, he just said, forget it. I'm not going to bring Ramos in. I'll wait until I get to Ortiz. Here is a 1-0 pitch with the bases loaded in the dirt. 2-0. Back 
in the third inning with the bases loaded one out. He hit into an inning ending double play and bang. So you're telling me he's using a different bat. I would think so. <laughs> they are deep in the outfield and they are shifted on the infield for Ortiz to pull. He's got only three RBIs off left handed pitching all year. Here comes a 2 0. Got under it, popped him up. Shallow left. Joyce is there. Two out. And we'll see if that bat makes it in one piece back into the dugout. Yeah, that's a frustrating at bat for him. He got into a good count. And you can see he's just pulling off some balls just a little bit. But I go back to what you said last time, and I know you and Tom aren't completely on the same page. But Bogarts is the guy backing him up in this lineup, hot hitter or not. That may switch with what Napoli has done here tonight. Yeah, it, I, I think it's got to switch, but it's not my call. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, it's not. Not really, but for the purposes of television, it is. <laughs> Here comes Fernando Salas coming in, bases loaded. It is still a two run game somehow in Boston. Fernando Salas has taken over. Angels fans, you can tune in tomorrow on Fox Sports West for the final game of this set. Coverage begins at 10 a.m. Pacific. It'll be Hector Santiago off a good start against Wade Miley. He's been on a nice little run of late. The overall numbers aren't that great for Miley, but he's coming off a good one as Xander Bogarts, who is 0 for 3, will deal with Salas trying to add to the Red Sox lead. Swihart, the runner at third. Luki Betts is at second, and Hanley Ramirez, who singled to knock out Pestano, is over at first. Good job by Ramos. Fell behind. Ortiz came back and got him on a pop up. And it's Bogarts and Salas. Strike one. Salas came with David Freeze from St. Louis in the deal. That sent Peter Borges and Randall Grichik from the Angels organization to the Cardinals. And of the four, it seems like the best long term, long range guy will be Grichik, the yeah. dynamic player. The 0 1. Strike two. And Grichik's back healthy now, playing center field. He's going to be a good player. And Borges has been better this year than he was last year, his first year in St. Louis. So both players are doing well in 2015 for the Cardinals. You see Salas probably try to expand the zone here ahead with two fastballs, maybe to the curveball. And a base hit right side. No curveball. Bogarts delivers, and it's a 6 2 game here at Fenway Park in the seventh. 
Nice, nice job of hitting. It's a ball down and away. And Tom, you've been talking a lot about two strike approaches. Yeah, this obviously catches too much of the plate and it's up. I just question the sequencing. Three straight fastballs, 90 miles an hour. Got three good looks at it. And really a mistake mostly in location. Wasn't crazy about selection, but really location is what hurt Salas right there. Well, the location for Napoli after a couple of swings in this game has been over the wall and left. He's got two home runs and a walk tonight. Strike one. He's never had a three homer game. The last one he hit could count for two. He's already hit that sign once. Yeah, that first one should have counted for two. Almost hit that sign on a rope. Two on, two out, two runs home, four run lead, and that's a strike. Here they are. Quack. Both of them. Good swings. I think he missed his pitch right there, though. That, that pitch that he just took 0 1. Here's the 0 2. Mm. Well, these pitches are too good on 0 2. <laughs> Another mistake. Yeah. You saw Perez set up almost in the other batter's box and watch the glove of Perez, how far it has to come back. Big miss right there. You're lucky he missed that. Better roll it up there. Sometimes you get. 0-2 and you can't miss a spot enough to set you up for the next one. Just roll it up there. Give him that, that one right here. Well, it counts nothing in two still. Two on. Runners at first and second. Two out. Bottom of the seventh. Struck him out. But the damage is done and it's Xander Bogarts with a two out two run single to right that sends us into the eighth inning at Fenway Park. We have to talk quick in 2015 going to break at 6-2 Red Sox. Bullseye coming to Fox. People going through fire, flying through air, all while trying to hit a bullseye. Twilight's Kellen Lutz and comedian Godfrey host Bullseye series premiere this Wednesday on Fox. What a year it's been already for Tozawa. I was going to say, Joe, isn't that what Napoli did in the second yes. inning? Bullseye? 
If we determined if he hit that bullseye sign in left or not, he didn't hit the bullseye, but I think he hit the poster board out there in left field. We got StatCast working on it. <laughs> Tozawa has been an outstanding setup, man. Gio Vitella, the number nine hitter with Ibar and Trout to follow. That was a big hit by Bogarts in the bottom of the seventh. Ooh. That's two that have knocked the mask off the face of the rookie Swihart. Yeah, after I get that done, I may have to go to that hockey mask. I don't know if anybody's done a real definitive study on that hockey mask and if that lessens the blow of a foul tip like that as opposed to that more squared up, flatter, typical catcher's mask. I know Mike Matheny wore it at the end of his career and those blows still got him. The collisions of the plate and those foul tips off the mask and he had to call it a career. Yeah. You would think. You would think that with with an NFL helmet with the remember they used to have the bike helmet had the air and yeah. now you got the shut helmet and everybody continues to protect that. You would take some of that technology and put it in the catcher's helmet. I would think. Yeah, there really isn't much that's been done along those lines. I'm sure they've looked at it. With all the data with head injury. Here's a foul right side. It will get out of play. I mean, give me a football helmet and put a mask in front of it. And we're good to go. <laughs> I know Evan Gaddis with the Braves last year, he was experimenting or actually using a mask that was lined with Kevlar inside the hockey style mask. You see a lot of the old school types among the umpires and catchers still. I'll tell you one time. <laughs> be into yeah. that. You'd be wearing a football helmet, H. <laughs> Give me a new <laughs> score. Put me in the outfield. Another one-two pitch. Giovatella gets under it, skies it into center. Big swing for the second baseman. Ryan Field is hanging out in Los Angeles, eating M&Ms and giving us a game break. Yeah, and how about the game that happened this week with the matchup of Clayton Kershaw and Madison Bumgarner and Bumgarner getting the win and taking Kershaw deep on a bomb of a home run for the first run of that game. Great. That was a great game. Two nothing game. Very well pitched. He did hit a rocket too. He had four home runs last year as a pitcher. I love it. We don't need no stinking DH. That's what <laughs> Mad Bum is telling us, and I agree with him. <laughs> One out, nobody on. 1 0 pitch to Ibar. He's hot. He shoots the gap in left center field. It checks up a bit. Betts comes up throwing wide of the bag. They had a shot at Ibar. Instead, it's a one out double. What a beautiful play, though. Watching Mookie Betts cut that ball off. He was flying. Look how far he has to go to cut this ball off. And if he's able to make an accurate throw, he even circled it. Make an accurate throw, he's got it. It's great baseball play. Ibar hustling the whole way. He's thinking, too, no doubt. And right there, he said, my goodness, he got to that ball. Yeah, that's impressive. And a guy who was a second baseman in yep. Mookie Betts. Here's Trout. Up. Picked it up quick. Just a great athlete. Trout tonight is 0 for 3. Strike one from Tozawa. It's amazing. The two youngest everyday center fielders in baseball playing in this game. Mookie Betts, of course. And yeah, Mike Trout. Still only 23. Hard hit like a rocket into left center field, and that will make it a three-run game. Ibar scores easily. Trout has his first hit of the night, and it's 6-3 here in the eighth inning as the Angels break through against Tozawa. You know, it's interesting watching Ibar at second base. He started to go back towards the bag because of the score. You know, he's not going to get thrown out. And Trout hits the ball so dang hard, and they got to play him in instead of being able to play him back 
to re because of the speed. Yeah, that's Tozawa's third pitch, the curveball. Doesn't throw a lot of them, but Mike Trout will force you to overthink on the mound, and that was a hanger that he absolutely hammered. Here comes Carl Willis. Now the pitching coach for the Boston Red Sox as action starts again for Boston in their bullpen. You, you want to see the, 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 how Mike Trout from Stoutcast changes the game from Statcast. Here's a good look at it with Mike Trout. Is he, because of where they have to play him and his speed, here's a ball. Brennan Crawford catches. He throws it across the diamond 83 miles an hour. Okay? And Trout's getting down the line, running 21 miles an hour. I mean, this is a routine ground ball. You see this effort every day. But because of where Crawford has to play him, he plays him eight feet in front of where normally you'd play him at because of his speed. If he's back eight feet, Trout's safe every time. And so we just saw where Bogarts had to play Trout because of his speed. And now he has to dive for ground ball. He's got no chances by you. So many ways he can hurt you. Pujols goes after the high delivery from Tozawa. Strike one. So there's the run that Tozawa's been on and the first run he's allowed in his last ten appearances. Pujols homered here last night. He's got 528 in his career. Here's the 0-1. Throwing hard at 95, a ball and a strike. Well, Joe, you were talking uh, pitching with John Farrell earlier, and he said this is the guy I want in the eighth regardless of situation. No matchups. He's the guy that I want. I thought that was interesting. Maybe overthrowing a bit. That one stays up. That splitter at 85 in the count, two and one. Yeah, that'll put a concerned look on your face. You're right. The split, that's a pitch. Obviously, he wants to start at the knees, almost bounce it. Almost slipped out of his hand, went up. Here's a 2 1. Foul back, and Pujols had a pitch to rip, and he just could not. Put it into play. Well, we're so close you can hear him grunt after the swing. Ah! Well, he'd love to have that back. The count two and two. Pujols hitting 235 at the start of the game at 237. One on, one out, one run home, three run game. Boston on top in the eighth. A tester for Holt, only play to first. Two out. Down to second is Trout. He talked earlier, H, about Trout's speed. He got a kick there as a fire drill at third base. Three different players went to go cover the bag <laughs> in case Mike Trout had designs of continuing on. Bogarts, Tazawa. And Swihart all made a dash to third. They know who's on the bag. I wouldn't want to run myself into a collision with Mike Trout going to third either. Watch this. It occurs to everybody. That's Mike Trout. Get over there. It was well covered. <laughs> so he's at second, two out, and the batter is Cole Calhoun. Who made a key error in the bottom of the seventh inning. On a ball down the right field line, he could not handle. Ball one up and away. That was on a ball hit by Mookie Betts, who later came around to score on the two out, two run single by Xander Bogarts. So a couple of unearned runs, big ones in the seventh. Check swing, strike one. Yeah, when you go back through a game and you start looking at certain situations where you might have won a game or lost a game, there are certain plays that stand out, and I'm sure that's one that Calhoun's looking at going, I should have had, but you go from a two-run game to a four-run game at that point, it just changes how everything's played. Especially with these guys coming up. 
Giovatella fly to center, then a double by Ibar, RBI single by Trout. Pujols grounded out. And now Calhoun. Instead of a chance to tie the game with a hit, he can make it just a two run game with a single, a one run game with a home run, and he's in the hole one and two. If Freeze bats in this top of the eighth, he will represent the tying run. Got him looking, inning over. 95 from Tazella. The RBI by Trout. Red Sox leading as they come to the plate in the bottom of the eighth. 6 3 at Fenway. Soft surface and by Pepsi, the official soft drink of MLB. Bottom of the eighth inning and Castillo first up. Rusne is after the first pitch and fouls it left side strike one against Fernando Salas who gave up the two out two run single to Bogarts in the seventh. Koji Uehara is getting loose to try and close it for Boston. In the ninth inning, it'll be Freeze, Joyce, and Perez, the scheduled hitters. Mm. Right side might stay playable. Giovatella is there, and he's got it. Not an easy play, one out. Watch every out-of-market game live in HD on more than 400 devices with MLB.TV Premium. The number one live streaming sports service. They provide real time highlights, live look ins, pitch tracking, widget, and more. Every night on every device, visit MLB.tv for details. Well, that was a nice play. It went a long way to get that ball. And we talked about earlier how that ball's starting to bend back when it, once it gets to the corners. There's Holt, strike one. Brock, the number eight hitter, 0 for 2 with a walk and a run scored.
Ball and a strike from Fernando Salas. A little story of the Red Sox season up until this series. A lack of clutch hitting. Certainly turned that around the last two nights. Look, if a Red Sox team doesn't hit in Fenway Park, that's just a bad hitting club. They're going to hit. This ballpark lends to too much offense for you over the course of a season. There's just too many holes, too many fly balls go off the monster. A lot of things can happen. Big right field. I mean, listen, they're not going to hit 197 against left-handed pitching. They're not going to hit 203 in scoring position the whole year. And that's why the, the, the division is interesting. They've, they've played about as poor as they're going to play for a two-month stretch. And they're still in it. They haven't figured. They're just figuring out their pitching. The offense is starting to come. They're in this thing. That's outside. This team was built to hit. They have all the outfielders. You think about a game like tonight. Think about the absence of Alan Craig, who was shipped out. The guy they picked up from the Cardinals last year in July was taken off the roster. Any team in the big leagues could have claimed him. They would have owed him a ton of money, but... He's now playing at triple A as Holt is on for the second time tonight. Obviously at some point there's going to be a run on some rental pitching. One guy who wouldn't be considered a rental pitcher would be Cole Hamels who's red hot right now and for more on the market for Cole Hamels let's go down to Ken Rosenthal. Joe Cole Hamels beat the Nationals today his fourth straight victory. He has been brilliant of late. And I spoke with the Phillies general manager Ruben Amaro today. And while it's a little early for trade talk, he says he expects clubs to start jumping in because of Hamill's ability, because of his pedigree. Now, Hamill's, as you said, is signed long term. He's owed at least $96 million over the next four years. And if he wants the Red Sox to pick up his fifth year option in exchange for waiving his no trade clause, it would go up to 110 over five years. But. The Phillies have made it quite clear to teams that they are willing to pick up parts of contracts in order to move players as long as they get better talent in return. How about this hit and run? What a piece of hitting by Swihart. They're going to bring Holt all the way around. He scores down to second, safe. And it's 7-3. to three. And do you hear this crowd, how exciting speed baseball is? This just ignited the place. Well, there was article after article today about the base running of last night's game, an ugly fifth inning, the defense in the top of the fifth, and Tom, this base running is as good as it gets. Hey, give credit to the staff. 0-1 oh, pitch, that's not your traditional hit and run, but I love the aggressiveness, too, of Brian Butterfield. The third base coach has been waving Brock Holt around this entire time. Love the aggressiveness. It makes it seven to three now Pedroia takes a strike. But it all started with a crazy swing by that man Swihart on a hit and run. He had to try and make contact and on a pitch down and in somehow was able to put the bat on it and get a base hit to right. Well, element of surprise. Hacking out of Pedroia 0 and 2. And you know why you put an 0-1 hit and run on? We've been watching Salas now for two innings, right? He's been around the plate. Remember the 0-2 counts he had, Joe, and he wasn't able to. He kept throwing balls there to hit. Hanley, 0-2, right there. We go, oh man, he's throwing too many good pitches. When you got a guy continually around the plate, they took a gamble and it paid off on him. Ball one. And I love the job that Brian Butterfield does. Look how far down the line he is already at third base. Runner on second base. He will bring you around the bag and then stop you late. Rather than a lot of third base coaches may hang around the bag and they'll send you after you get to the bag. It's go, go, go until I tell you to stop. You can only do that when you work down the line the way that Butterfield does. Third year is the third base coach for Brian Butterfield with the Red Sox. Well, and there's, there's certain things... Tom, go ahead and you take this because you were bragging yeah, watch, on this. Watch Butterfield. That. that arm is already moving here all the way down the line so he gets a good look. Holt is a good four steps from the bag, and that go sign is up. Don't awesome. wait till he gets around the bag. And Holt gave him a chance, too, man. He gave him a great read, a full effort the whole way. It's a great play. 
That's rocketing into left. And Joyce is there for out number two. Pedroia frustrating night, one for five. And the batter will be Mookie Betts. Who's driven in a run, scored a run. And he will try to give the Red Sox their biggest lead of the night. I think this kid's going to be a star. He's trying to figure it out right now, but the ability is just off the charts. Runner at second, two out. Strike one. Well, his spring training was ridiculous. I mean, nobody could get him out. I realize spring training now feels like a long, long, <laughs> long time ago and a land far, far away, but he's got as you said quick hands he's got great baseball instincts and I, I agree I mean they they are parting the way for this guy to step forward and be a star and it's going to get interesting I mean he was one of the big reasons that Cole Hamels is not pitching in the Red Sox uniform right now and that's a big gamble when you start looking at all the depth that the Red Sox supposedly have with all their prospects that they, you thought they'd be the number one team lined up. I don't know if they're the number one club anymore. And you're saying that because the word is the Red Sox won't part with Mookie Betts in a deal to get Cole Hamels. Mookie Betts, Swihart, you know, those are the two big names that were held up in a possible move. I, I tell you, Cole Hamels, at, let's say it's $100 million, they pick up the option for five years with the prices we're seeing pitchers get. I don't know. Somebody's going to get a steal of a deal if you ask me. Here are the numbers over his last four starts. And you would have to think, Tom, the market will just grow between now and the trading deadline for somebody like Hamels. Yeah, as Ken said, it's a little early. Usually that market develops another month from now. But I like going back to 08 when the Brewers traded for CC Sabathia. There's a base hit into left field. Here comes the runner, Swihart from second, safe in the biggest lead of the night. As the Red Sox have opened it up, 8-3. to three. Well, there's those quick hands right there. There's not many fastballs you can throw by this kid. Fastball out over the plate. He's able to get the hands out and pull it. It's nice. This kid's not going anywhere. You know, just to finish the thought, the Brewers in 08 with Sabathia, you know, he was on the market, and they said, we want him now. Let's not wait till the trade deadline when that auction atmosphere develops. And they told Cleveland, here's the deal. Let's do it. It was early July, and they got it done before the All-Star break. I would suspect not a team might do that with Hamels, maybe even in June. You know, and, and my final point is we look at Hanley. Take that fastball change up, I should say. But my final point is Ryan Howard's going with him. You're going to look at what the Atlanta Braves did. You can go back and look what the Red Sox did with the Dodgers. You want a certain player, you're taking this with you. And if the Phillies are willing to take some money back, just very similar to what the Angels did with Josh Hamilton. Yeah, we're going to eat $25 million of it, but we got rid of 100 some. You know what I mean? And that philosophy is going to come into play, I believe, with the Phillies with this Cole Hamels deal. 2-0 the count on Hanley Ramirez. The question I would have with regard to the Sabathia trade is the package that was given up and sent to Cleveland none of those guys really panned out at all and it, at the time it was like can you believe the package of young talent that they just gave up for CC Sabathia who almost single handedly carried that Brewers staff the only guy really to come out of that Brantley I would guess and that's the thing with Philadelphia and Ruben Amaro you have to win that deal. You have to get players that turn around your franchise. But if they're able to make the deal with Ryan Howard in it, you just saved a hundred million dollars in one move with two players. Yeah, but over a hundred million. That organization needs talent, and you're going to trade assets like that. You better get major league ready players. Besides the salary relief, I, I agree with that. And they can do that. I mean, that that's the chip that Cole can bring. One on, two out. And that gets away. Down to second is Betts. And this has been a rough outing for Salas.
You want a list of the rentals in the starting category? Cueto's on that list. For sure. The lesser guys with Harang, Kazmir, Kyle Loesch, and some other guys who are free agents to be, but right now on teams that are in the thick of it and figure to be for the rest of the way. 3-2 pitch. Guys like Price and Zimmerman, Samarja, Granke. Granke could opt out of his deal at the end of the year with the Dodgers. That's an interesting one. They need Granke though. They're going to they're going to be in it with him. Especially with Ryu going down. Their pitching depth isn't as deep as it was two months ago when they were constructing their club. That's into right field will carry to Calhoun and the inning is over. But two more runs on the board for the Red Sox. And as we go into the ninth inning. Ryan, thanks. You see John Lackey got the start there, former Red Sox right-hander. And here is a current Red Sox right-hander, Koji O'Hara, who is strong yet again. He just had a streak snapped where he went great appearances. Hitters went 0 for 23 against him, scoreless over seven and two-thirds. And he fires a strike to start the at-bat for David Fries in a five-run game. Well, and that's the difference right there. He got the fastball back and started throwing it for strikes. He was throwing too many splits. Here's a fly ball into center. Back is Betts in front of the wall. A leap and a catch. One away. Beautiful play. Here we go. Move. Look at him know where he's at. Uh, you know, to me, the growth of him in the outfield is astonishing. To catch it that quick, catch on that fast when you haven't played out there since really high school. He was a second baseman in pro ball. And you're playing these tough angles. We've watched balls be dropped in here last night, tonight. He's playing a heck of a center field. He was a shortstop in high school. Really didn't get to center field until right before he got called up last year. Amazing play there. 
thing that caught my attention, he took his eyes off the ball twice while going back on that ball like a 15-year center field goal glover and still tracked it. It's a lot of work. There's Joyce, count 2-0. Oh. Those are the great center fielders that can take their eye off the ball, move, relocate the ball, and make the play. That's ball three, three and oh. Mm. Joyce was on base last night, four times on base tonight, twice with a hit and a walk. Three and one. Another game break coming if we get the chance. Here's the three one pitch. It's a one out walk. Let's do it here. Ryan it's all yours. Yeah, losing streak that has seen them replace Mike Redmond as their manager. Why? General manager Dan Jennings taking over. To the surprise of everyone. I was going to say, captured a nation. <laughs> First pitch of ball to Perez, and that draws Swihart out to talk to O'Hara. Well, that's a snake bitten team down there in Florida trying to get it going. Stanton has caught fire. He's got 12 home runs, 40 RBIs to lead the National League, and Ichiro. 2,875 hits here. Yeah. 1,000 plus in Japan, right? I mean,. And what is he, 42? Somewhere in there? A bad week for the Babe. Alex Rodriguez matched him in career RBIs, and Ichiro passes him on hits. Yeah, he's old. <laughs> he's done. The <laughs> Babe? What has he done lately? <laughs> Nothing. 2 and 0 the count. Uohara. 3 and 0. Nature was 41. I gave him an extra year. Long ago, Babe Ruth played. 100 years ago. Numbers are still standing. It's incredible. He was uh, better than everybody else <laughs> back then. <laughs> everybody. 3 0. Another walk from Uohara. Go ahead and say it, Tom. Sometimes these closers, when they're in a non save situation, it's just not there. <laughs> The power of adrenaline, I guess, huh? or lack thereof in a situation like this. Well, you know what? He just created himself some drama right here. Walking the Angels back into this game somewhat. John Farrell back onto the phone. See if they get anybody up. The Red Sox are left. With Craig Breslow, Tommy Lane, Matt Barnes, who was touched up for home runs last night, and a right hander they just called up as they sent Robbie Ross out, Heath Hembry. Wow. And nobody's up. Right now it's Uahara, who is behind the mound a moment ago working on mechanics, trying to find the strike zone as the batter will be Mark Cross, the DH. Cross over three. He can make it interesting. Strike one. Uh, I was waiting for that. He hadn't thrown his pitch. That little change up the whole time. It's like, okay, I understand you got five runs, but let's go to work like you'd normally work and get some outs. Strike two. Whoop, whoop. That's the split. You can throw that the way other people throw their fastballs when it comes to commanding it. These are two teams that started this ball game, each hitting 235 as a group. 
Off the end of the bat, long run. Castillo closing on it fast. Two out. Tell you what, he was flying. That's the one change here in Fenway with the Red Sox. They put that speed in right field. Victorino kind of opened their eyes to the fact you can have almost like a center fielder type play there. That run they made to the World Series a few years back. Paid off there. Giovatella now two on two out. Strike one. Mookie Betts has a job to do in center for the Red Sox with Hanley Ramirez to his right, who is new and not that comfortable in left field, former infielder shortstop. And Rusne Castillo to his left in right field, who's a former center fielder playing a tough right at Fenway. One ball, one strike. I remember when they signed Castillo and watched him work out. The he was playing in the infield. You know, will he be in the outfield or will he be in the infield? They were looking at that combination. And we just show we just saw he can run. Mm -hmm. There's another strike as it moved back over the plate. And the Angels are down to their final strike as the Red Sox try to come back after a loss last night and split the first two games of this set. And for Boston up to 20 wins on the year 20 and 23 while the Angels are a game over at 22 and 21 in a three hour nine minute game and Boston despite being three games under 500 just three and a half games out of first in the AL East. Final score is 8 to 3 for Harold Reynolds and Tom Verducci and Ken Rosenthal. Pete Macheska, our producer. That did hit the sign out in the seats above the monster. <laughs> Bill Webb, our director. So long. Big night for Napoli. Two home runs, two tape measure jobs. And the Red Sox win it 8 3. So long from Fenway Park.